Hello, everyone. Hopefully, that is better. Hopefully, he says. Hopefully, that's not crackling away, and hopefully, it's all working. Um, and not too quiet. <laughs> right. You'll notice there has been some addition to today's uh, collection sitting next to me. There is the milk of human heart kindness. And thankfully, there is last night's takeaway as my tea. And the breakfast. Uh, uh, well, and lunch. I think I had breakfast. Right. Hello, Brock Payne. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Stephanie Wilson. Hello, Jay Richardson. Hi, Ian Carr. Hello, Martin Doherty. Hi, Bishon. Hi, Blue Shirt Buddha. Hi, J J Illingworth. Hi, Abelzaski. Hi, Paul jo Johnson. Hi, Daniel Freeman. <laughs> Hi, Steph Thompson. Hi, Jay Richardson. Again. I never do the homework. I don't know how anyone has time for it. They are a bit long, I do admit. Hello, Jay. Hi, Sean Mac. Hi, Angus. Hi, Michael. Hi, Amen. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Gigolo. Hi, KB7Get. <laughs> I say the bot kid. <laughs> Hi, Michael Truett. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. ORP oh, Suckle. I, I love her. You know, I, I, I love the fact... You know, I, I have always thought, and mentally, the... I have to admit, the Polish destroyers were always the more interesting to me. But their submarines are just as... How do I put this politely? Their submarines are just as dramatic. Hopefully that turns down the crackling. If there was any crackling there, nah. Right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Sam Thompson, very good. We'll have intros. We'll have to ask my Malt friend's Malt uh, grandma about Maltero's again. Aggressive. They were definitely aggressive. Um, it's one of those interesting scenarios when you're looking at these summary. You sort of Malta is always this name. Is sort of as I said, I, I, the best I could describe was. It is under siege while itself at its at the same time besieging the enemy. And I was trying to think of a similarity of it in any sort of wartime. And I thought really it was like Caesar when he was putting down the Gauls. Because he's got both the Gauls he's laying siege to. And he's got one line of fortifications built around. Then he builds a second line of fortifications around himself to, uh, because there are, uh, another Gaulish army turns up to try and freedom. So he's both being laid siege to at the same time as laying siege to the, uh, to the enemy. And that is very much Malta. Hmm. <laughs> Hello, Richard. Right. So, Vision. Well, Sir Richard Branson is still alive. Watching him see to uh, him to see new Virgin spaceship while listening to the Doctor. Mm, fun times. In cars, Malta somewhere referred to as an unsinkable aircraft carrier. To an extent, she was certainly. Jeff Vila, fun fact, during World War II, the Med was incredibly clear, and combined with having lots of shallow water, this makes it a bit hard for subs to hide. One reason for high loss rates, yes. Which is why I worry about modern submarines, which are even bigger in operating down there. Hmm. I was asking, well, the captains of Zoka and Dzik didn't like each other, and Lieutenant Commander Romanowski wanted to prove that he should command the Polish subgroup on Malta and not Lieutenant Commander Kozlowski of the circle. Pardon me. Um, yes. 
Thank you. So, some money for the book fund. That's very kind of you, Ghost Dead, uh, Ghost of Dread Robert, uh, <coughs> Pirate Roberts. Um, to be honest, one of the interesting things I find about it is that the RN really does, with that particular pairing of the submarines and Polish submarines in Tent Flotilla, does enjoy playing them off against each other to see which one's going to do better. So they're both grouped under Tent Flotilla. And, um, yeah, they work it out a great so that, you know, both are um, really very motivated. <laughs> motivated by both anti-German, anti-Italian <laughs> fire. As Drac once put it, they would have kept their ships going on sp uh, spit and hatred if they needed to. It's very much the case with the submarines. Bandholm, regarding Malta, did the submarines have a different harbour they could operate from? Because Valletta is really open and exposed. They operated around the place, um, but it's one of the interesting is that the first chapter of Periscope Patrol is really about where they sort of end up putting them their headquarters. And um, where they sort of end up putting themselves. And it's... Um, basically, they pick uh, Lazzarato. I think, as their main post. Uh, they go overshadowed by the 16th century Fort Manuel, guarding the entrance to the CLA in the harbour, and had an internal reminder of Malta's stormy story. The Lazzarato building sprawled for a quarter of a mile or more along the southern shores of Manuel. It's upper stories of war and the passages, stairs, suite rooms, and that's basically where the Royal Navy, um, the old quarantine station built by the Knights Hospitals at Manuel Island. Um, it's part of Lazzarato. That's where they get set up. This book is really, really cool. And I won't say which library this book particularly actually came from, because I bought it over Amazon secondhand, and it came from a library, which possibly shouldn't be selling it on, because it possibly should be being read. But they've all downsizing, so obviously not enough people reading it. It's sad. But, you know, it's an interesting topic. Making Mary Nostrum a hollow jest, are in summary to Mediterranean. It is one of the topics which actually came from Discord. Hmm. When we get to Tony Penfold, when we get to Malta, we will go into the um, task mechanism used by George Simpson. First of all, we're going to go through, like with the introductions, the first part is going to be about the submarines themselves. And it's going to look out. The second part is going to be how looking at how they use. So this one is going to be combined together. But you know, Jack, yeah, I need to warn about one thing. This it captain's memories are up coloured according to later research. Uh, a lot of them are up coloured a bit. There's a couple of them are down coloured, I think as well. I think the trouble is. Some submarines that ret don't return, it's very hard to work out whether they made any kills. And sometimes I think some of the submarines which didn't return, uh, they don't tend to signal much when they're out at sea because they don't want to reveal their position. So, um, you know, I I in my experience, I'm thinking some of the submarines which were lost possibly got more kills than they're credited with. And some of the submarines which <coughs> wandered around get more kills than they uh, get credit with more kills than I actually possibly did. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Don't so many great so many great commanders in the tenth and so many VCs, yes. The Thorin really did it well. And um they did have a lot of fun. <laughs> I've been while well since I heard of the S-Class rhyme Brought back some good memories with my uncle uh, Uncle, retired RCN Haven't seen him in six years now Ontario versus uh, oof, That's a long, long drive So Sherson, uh Hello for starters What is the chance that the Carthaginians or Phoenicians Did sail around Africa On behest of the Pharaoh uh, It would have been possible had they invented asymmetric cells Um uh, 
That's a little off topic, but I think it's quite possible they could have done, but that's a little off topic for submarines in the in the Mediterranean. Richard Hughes, Doug Clark, Ham was Gibraltar a submarine base. It basically is the submarine base for the entire of the Western Mediterranean. Um, basically, from Sicily to the entrance to the Mediterranean, it is Gibraltar territory. So that's the S-class boat. That's eight flotillas area, and they really are dominating there. Vision. A lot of my used books are library books. Interesting to see where they come from. Yeah, I've got far too many books from the Royal Navy Library Dartmouth. Far too many books. I'm bro uh, Jeff Beeler, I'm broken by Alison Miles was my introduction to Medsubs. Uh, mistook him for Alison McClellan, uh, but it was an amazing discovery. Hmm, cool. I was asking, yeah, Sokka on her first tour to Malta had to, to flee bombing. She went to Gibraltar with one third of battery broken. One shaft bent and multiple leaks from bombs. Literally held on by spit and blood of crew. That doesn't surprise me. Um, session. I read somewhere that the Italians were pretty good at anti summary warfare. Is this true or only in comparison to the Germans and Japanese? No, they were pretty good. They had a lot of sub hunters, a lot of little ships, and they had an advantage in the Mediterranean. Mediterranean is far easier waters in many respects for anti submarine warfare, in that it's usually calmer. So, therefore, it's going to sound strange. In the Atlantic and the Pacific, you have far bigger waves. So, it tends to be far easier to hide the trail of a periscope. In the Mediterranean, a periscope bobs up. That's going to create a weight which is visible most of the time. Jerison, in a lot of cases, it's cheaper to borrow from a library, lose the, lose the book, and pay for the book than to buy it. Hmm. Not that I've ever done that. Well, I know you wouldn't, Jay Richardson. Carl Harmon. Hello, Alex, and the audio is much better. I'm glad the audio is much better. I really do not know really watch what the problem was, because I literally have altered the gain by that much. It's a little bit teeny, teeny, and it's suddenly perfect. So the slightest knock, and it goes da 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 da. King George V, A, good for you, B, yeah, well, if, uh, you know, it's a good test of relationship, you know, I, I, I took my girlfriend around HMS Belfast for Valentine's Day, honestly, <laughs> I, the fact that she went around with me and she, uh, she seemed to have a good time and actually wants back to go back aboard um, old ships with me, it, it just testifies to the fact that there is <laughs> you know there is someone for everyone and I have managed to find the one. Oh I don't think anyone else would put up with me willingly going around <laughs> they just fell fast. Right. Um uh... mm. Abbasasi, uh, I went through um, Polish American murder in the Basasana in 1940 43 by Kapowski Boek. In general, M. Boeski uh, does a great job in debunking some of the reports and memoirs. Hmm. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Sounds good, KGB. All right. Bilge pumps. Now, if I could figure out how to play video on this without causing it to die, I would be playing a little video a clip of bilge pumps today because it was so much fun. And I've actually posted a clip, that clip to Twitter. And it's literally of Drax smiling when Michael Clapp says to him, of course you can call me Michael. And Drax sort of goes, I, it, it was so much fun. As I said, it was two and a half hours of recording. 
it took over so much of my day, but it was so worth it. Um, I think the Skype call lasted for about four hours in the end. It started at about, uh, let's see, we started at 10, 10 past 10. And we finished at somewhere in the region of 10 to 2. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's fun. Uh, Yes, and um, Richard Hughes, this is, I, I've got little cousins watching us and my girlfriend. So we're gonna, gonna keep these things, you know, and my girlfriend's mum and my mum all watching us. I think the one we'll least worry about is, you know, um, my one's, but well, me for years. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, hey, hi. Right. Probably least worried about my little cousins. Then the ones <laughs> aren't <is> too <laughs> upset. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Um, huh? So, getting back to submarines, and getting back to the fun that is submarines, because, let's be honest, submarines are pretty cool. Are in submarines and into war. What were they designed for? This is the first thing. The amount of people when I'm talking about submarines and I'm talking about the interwar period, they started going, ah, yes, well, they should be designed to do this, which is basically commerce warfare in the Atlantic. And you go, why would the Royal Navy want to do that? Under what circumstances is the Royal Navy going to be using submarines to intercept commerce warfare in the Atlantic? What point? At what point is the Royal Navy going to be blockaded and unable to get its cruisers out there to catch them? And the Royal Navy always prefers capturing ships to sinking them. It's far more financially lucrative. And it's better for the economy. <laughs> oh. So it does make things work, you know, differently. It's a different system. You can't... You know, you start when I people start complaining. Oh, the Germans have better submarines than the British do. They often start going, going, "Well, how are they better? Oh, they're technically more advanced. They're not really. They're about the same level. Broadly speaking, they develop at the same pace. In fact, it's arguable that the British, which are tend to sort of develop sort of some sort of streamlining and stealthing a little bit earlier, um, actually get there quicker, but. The joyous scenario is that, you know, you're, there, there is the mindset always that the Germans are the ones associated with submarines, the British aren't, because the British use their submarines differently, because the British have different opportunities. The British will be imposing a blockade. That's what they'll be doing. So if they're fighting Italy in the Mediterranean, they would be imposing a blockade on them, and the submarines will be part of that imposing of the blockade. It's the same in a later part of a war versus Japan or a war versus Germany. The submarines are part of the blockading force, which means they're ambush predators. They're going to be sitting there watching, waiting in position for there's something to come out to kill. They're also going to be ambush predators in times of the beginnings of war, if you're thinking about it versus Japan again. Now, if you're thinking about Japan, again, you've got the problem of Japan's fleet is going to outnumber the Royal Navy in the Far East initially. So, how do you whittle them down? Well, first of all, you send your cruisers out to do the economic warfare, to go and attack Japanese trade all over the Pacific and in the North China, in the East China Sea and everywhere else they can get to. And that will make the Japanese have to decide to either convoy or abandon their trade. If they convoy it, 
If they abandon it, they're gonna their economy is going to get problem uh, screwed up. Excuse the French. If they convoy it, they're going to have to use a load of escorts for it, which means when their fleet comes running into the South China Sea, heading for Singapore, and they go through the various choke points, and there are some lovely Royal Navy submarines sitting there waiting to go, let loose the salvo. They haven't got any enough ASW to protect them. So the thing is, they either take all the ASW they can with them to try and get them through those choke points and abandon all their merchant ships. In which case, the Royal Navy wins by taking out their merchant ships, which means that no matter what happens down at Singapore, the Japanese aren't getting anywhere because without merchant ships, they're not going to be moving any troops anywhere because... There isn't a huge amphibious fleet. They are going to be using converted merchant ships as troop ships. Everyone does. But if, if, and this is the joyous if, if they don't abandon their merchant ships, if they do convoy and escort them, which is what the Royal Navy were doing, so to the extent they presume the Japanese would do this, then... Oh, then they send their lovely battleships and their aircraft carriers straight through those straits without enough escorts to deal with the ambush predators that will be the Royal Navy's O-class, P-class, R-class and T-class submarines sitting there going, hello, Mr. Battleship, bye-bye. And that's the whole point of it. That's what I was doing. And yes, we talk about treaties, but... The treaties is one thing. It's actually also the tyranny of distance and the logistics of it. You know, if you've got a fixed tonnage, a maximum tonnage of what you can build, then you need a certain number of hulls. And so that's why you end up building smaller. If you don't have that treaty limitation, you can build as big as you like to get that distance and still get the numbers. In car, Germans seem to have been, had been uh, better with diesel engines. Honestly, the British diesel submarine engines were fairly good. Um, they're certainly very reliable, <laughs> and they kept going. So, you know. Main book today. British submarines in two world wars by Norman Freeman. Mainly, I decided to pick on this because I needed a one book to standardize my figures and my sums around. And so I picked the only book which had everything as inclusive as it ever has, which is Norman Freeman's. So that's the main book today. Um, when the Germans captured a British submarine, the Germans considered it a technological coup, as it had all sorts of navigation gear that the Germans didn't have. True, true is, vice versa, is vice versa. Oh, class. Yeah. Bitchon, the lack of opportunity for sub-commerce raiding for Iron helps explain British government's support for banning it by international treaty. Um, also, it would have made it easier for the Royal Navy, because look at how many surf uh, how many escorts they had to build and man. How what all that stuff they had to do for anti-submarine warfare. You get rid of it, you suddenly have free up your air groups for strike, because they don't have to do anti-submarine warfare patrols. You free up surface air uh, long-range aircraft for bombing missions, because they don't have to do anti-submarine warfare patrols. You free up all that manning, etc., and all your destroyers from convoy escort duty to going out with the fleet, and you just have to leave some battle, uh, some cruisers with the convoys in case a surface raider shows up. Um. Jeff G. Beeler, the Germans have way more targets than British, helped by Mussolini declaring war with much of his merchant fleet outside the Med. Mm-hmm. That was the case, and the British hoovered them up, as they did with the German ones as well. Going out a bit late? Don't worry. Carl Harman. Start. To blockade any Mediterranean country only requires a few ships off coast nearby. You will need a battle squadron, though, to make sure no one tries to fight through this. Is this correct? Mm, yes and no. The trouble is with the Mediterranean is it's so close together that aircraft... The Mediterranean is the first sea that aircraft can, can come to actually achieve a level of dominance over. And it's because of the uh, role of flying boats, seaplanes and land-based aircraft that honestly, you have way, way... They have way, way too much power and influence. They, they sort of, they can wander around. You have maps up here which show the limits of the aerodromes. 
And this has a big impact on what the Royal Navy, what any Navy can really achieve. So, yes and no. The thing is, if you can have the blockade being partially enforced by submarines, then that means even if the aircraft goes out and doesn't see a surface ship, they can't pronounce it safe and they're not being blockaded. So that's why submarines would be part of the blockade. Submarines, aircraft carriers, battleships, the whole lot to blockade a modern country in this period. As Stephanie Wilson, I agree with that completely. Um, she just replied to King George V. Age is relevant here. What counts as interest? And that is always my view. I try and pitch everything so that everyone can enjoy it. And everyone who's basically who is either completely new to the subject or very experienced can draw something from it. And everyone who of any age can enjoy it. And that's what I like to keep the um, chat as. All right, then. Paul oh, Johnson, don't know if there's, don't know if anyone else is having the same problem, but you're out of sync. It's like watching a dubbed French film. I have no idea why I'm out of sync. Ooh, if I am, I don't know. It's in sync for me. Try refreshing, Christophe Wilson. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Carl Johnson. Aviation played a significant end role even in 1915 in the Adriatic. Yes, I know, in the Adriatic. It just gets a while before it takes over the whole Mediterranean. And by World War II, it's pretty much the whole Mediterranean. Hi, Thomas Rowella. Now, let's see. Uh... <laughs> One book to rule the middle. Oh, oh, my precious. <laughs> I thought KGV... Uh... <laughs> no. Albert Zaski, RN actually wasn't expecting that they won't be able to freely operate cruises in the Mediterranean as commerce control, and that's why subs became so important. Conclusion I got when watching previds. To an extent, they were expecting cruisers to be able to do part of the... And they were used as part of commerce control. Again, don't think they weren't. Cruisers were wandering around. Destroyer groups were wandering around. There's a brilliant thing called the Battle of Cape Bon, where four Royal Navy destroyers, two, three of them tribal class, um, no, two tribal class, one Polish, uh, no, was it two or three Polish uh, tribal class? I think it's two tribal class, one Polish and one J class destroyer, but I might be wrong, it might be three tribals, roll up a bond, three Italian, uh, two Italian cruisers and sink them. Literally, they catch the Italian cruisers, the Italian cruisers are sailing on going, well, do, running the supplies, we're all happy, we're all happy. Fudge, we got sunk. <laughs> that is what's happening on a fairly regular basis in the Mediterranean. Never think that the Royal Navy ships aren't out there. But the trouble is, during daytime hours, they have to be fairly careful and try and keep to the middle part of the Mediterranean or to their coast to keep out of easy range of being overwhelmed by aircraft. Whereas the submarines can be anywhere, day or night. And they are. So it's a case of it's adapting to the operations rather than not being able to. And it's how they adapted to. But the submarines were always part of it because the Royal Navy was always functioning air power into it. I'm just going to move this forward so it doesn't squeak. <laughs> Adriatic location filming. I wouldn't mind that. That could be fun. Jeff Beeler, it seems Med British subs spent their days submerged servicing at night to recharge, unlike access subs, which stayed serviced during the day. To an extent. And the... In a case of the access subs, it wasn't central, sensible to surface at the age either, because... Just because the British air presence was more restricted than the Axis forces in certain parts of the Mediterranean didn't make it just as dangerous. And one of the interesting parts in the Western Mediterranean is the amount of aircraft, amount of times that 
how do I put this politely? Uh, Italian subs and occasionally a few German subs get bounced by aircraft from operating from Cyprus. It's where the British have some fun. Uh, Ian Carter, refuser class of cruisers made nuisance of themselves from Malta. That they did. They had a lot of fun from Malta, the refuser class did. Angus Asano, Dr. Clark, did RN subs have problem with um, bioluminescence? Um, they would have had the same problem in the same patches of their training as the um, Axis subs did, but mainly bioluminescence has an impact in, t in Mediterranean. The big area it does is actually not far from Gibraltar. And actually, it's not far from the Straits of Gibraltar, and it covers quite a large area, which is why there was quite so many uh, submarines killed trying to get through just sneak past Gibraltar at night. It really wasn't good for them. What am I on? Ch Choco, milk, or iron brew? Well, I have finished the milk, so I'm now on iron brew. And this is uh, one of the lovely bottles sent to me, courtesy of the lovely Anne, Louise, and Eric. So, thank you. <sighs> Although, to be fair, today is massively sponsored by my lovely mum, who has protected my chicken all day. From not only herself, because she likes KFC chicken, uh, but also from my do uh, from Raleigh, the doggy. So, food sponsored by Mum, drink sponsored by um. Hmm. Let's put it this way: the ladies in my life are taking care of me. Thankfully, <laughs> oh, I really should get better at taking care of myself. I'm quite good at taking myself to care of myself sometimes, but I do turn into a workaholic. Um, right. Did the Access have any anti-submarine anti uh, surface radar, or were the British subs relatively safe on the surface tonight? Uh, the Axis start to develop it towards the end of the war, but they really don't have it as early on, or as quickly, or as capable as the Allies do. They do start to get it there, and you know, it's it's wrong to think of our radar as literally a one-way system. Uh, Donald Fritz, did non-Japanese Axis powers ever have to face an anti-air barrage equivalent to the late Allied Pacific levels of anti-air in the Med? And if so, what nation's pilots handled it to the best? Well, honestly, yes, they did. The Japanese might have faced it as well, but the Royal Navy were mounting it quite heavily on many, many campaigns. Um, you have to remember quite a lot of the stuff which the Americans tend to develop into what's called the Pacific Air Barrage is our techniques which, to an extent, have already been learnt and practised running the Malta convoys and the convoys through the Mediterranean. Those convoys face humongous air attacks, constant air barrage attacks, and they have to mount a very, very, co uh, very, very efficient air defence as do um, the forces operating in the eastern Mediterranean, um, Crete and all these areas. So, to be honest, the Italians and the Germans have to face it, and you always get some pilots who will dive through, some pilots who will drop their bombs and, run and get away, because it's that much. Uh, you get a mixture of all of them. I don't think any Axis force really says they can claim they were the best, but I don't think anyone was the worst. I think they're all much and much much the same. I have a feeling if any uh, if any service could be accused of pressing it perhaps less strongly home, it's possibly the Italians towards late, uh, towards mid to late 1943, but that's because to a large extent the Italian forces knew which way the wind was blowing and they didn't really see much point in dying in that scenario. But there again, some still were fighting on bravely for the cause they believed in. Mm -hmm. um, Pat W, do we know if German Italian subs were attacked by the air aircraft? US subs occasionally had that problem out of Pearl Harbor. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, occasionally, German Italian subs were attacked by their own path. 
And it's, that's one of the reasons why that sort of issue is why in the Indian Ocean, the Japanese and the Germans had a rule that they weren't going to attack any submarines, which is what made the Germans and the Japanese so terrible. And I need submarine warfare in the Indian Ocean because they refused to attack them just in case they're attacking one of their allies. Uh, Bail Laura, aircraft from Cyprus covered Western Med, or did I miss here? They covered the Eastern Med. So Cyprus was the Eastern Med. Um, I might have said Western instead of Eastern. I hope I didn't, but it's Eastern Med and Mediterranean they covered. And basically, sometimes they would cause real fun. You'd have Malta covered the Centre Med, uh, Gibraltar the Western, and then uh, the various bases in in North Africa, in Egypt, Savaria, and so, uh, covered the southern half of the Eastern Med and Cyprus, the northern half of the Eastern Med. And sometimes aircraft would just fly between two. Did the RN operate from Cyprus? Yes, the RN did. So, Mac, radar isn't a yes-no thing. Look at the difference between SC radar and one generation on advance of the SG. That is the point, really. Sort of, just having the radar doesn't mean it necessarily is a good radar. And that was the loss of the problems for the Axis forcing radars was that Their development didn't always really work. They often had problems with them. Now, we've had the O-class, and we're now going to have the S-class up. And I haven't mentioned the S-class stats, but I want to because, well, I've got them here. And this is what I want to do. Why I want to talk about this is because I want to discuss, bring up the sort of the point which I tried to make in some of the videos. One, two videos. And I will try to make when I redo those two videos. So, surfaced 805 tons, submerged 995 tons, standard 715 tons. Standard, so, of course, is that artificial designation produced by treaties. But it's the important thing for counting treaty tonnage. But the really interesting thing, again, is that they have six torpedo tubes and 12 torpedoes. So they carry reload, a full set of reloads. All mounted forward. One three-inch gun. And they can do 3,800 nautical miles at 10 knots. Or 120 nautical miles at three knots are submerged. It's a ship design. It's a boat design for the Mediterranean. Honestly, where else in the world, other than the Mediterranean or the North Sea, would you have a range of three thousand eight hundred nautical miles at ten knots be a viable operating sk skill, uh, uh, a viable operating scenario? However, one hundred twenty nautical miles at at three knots underwater, that is a very good skill. Because let's be honest, the Mediterranean, the current isn't that massive, isn't that uh, super strong as a rule, even underwater. And if you've got a maximum speed of three knots underwater, you can probably use that to keep yourself in a very roundabout position, even against the strongest current you're likely to face. Uh, Dr. Fritz, I feel like the Axis would have been is have issues covering uh, providing air cover for the strike craft in Med with the limited range of the fighters they had available in the theatre. Honestly, they didn't have that much limited. or uh, limited. It wasn't as limited as you'd like to think. And you've got, remember, there's the ME-110 and various other long-range fighters which are included in their packages in the theatre. And the fact is their strike aircraft were often fairly decent aircraft as well. Not always brilliant, but fairly decent. And they had lots of bases to go from. Lots and lots of bases to go from on both sides of Ch of the Mediterranean. This was the thing. The center of the Mediterranean was pretty much an Axis-dominated airway. Especially once you lost the French. Because the whole idea was that the French was, you know, supposed to... Nicest way, the whole idea of the of North Africa campaign, if the 
French had still been in the war versus the and with the British is that the British would attack from one side of Italian North Africa, the French would attack from the other side of Italian North Africa, and they'd meet in the middle and go, "Hello, my friend, what's happened to the Italians?" You know, and the Italians when they fa are fairly good fighters, and they don't don't put them down do much. But you know, a nicest way in that scenario, they wouldn't have had much chance. Um, Eamon, what was Regia Marina uh, ASW doctrine and performance like? It was fairly good. For the time, it was fairly decent. It, I, I have to say, compared to what the RN and USN develop it to into by the end of World War II, it's nowhere near. Even by the middle of World War II, it's not really as good as theirs. But at the beginning of World War II, it's not that far off. Uh, Ian Carr, did RN subs get into the Black Sea in World War II as they did in World War One? So far, I'm not sure. I've been trying to look into it, and there are some sort of things, ideas about one or two maybe having got in there, but I haven't really found any sort of information that confirms that at the moment. The trouble is, at the moment, I'm limited. Archi I haven't, I'm not able to get the archives, and it's the books I've found online and I had myself. Sure, Mac. So I know. I was listening to Neptune's Inferno, and I was tearing my hair out at what Callahan was doing in the first night battle of G Garda Canal, and I imagine Scott was as well. Most people are what Callahan was doing. It's a bit funny how the British had quite a lot of types of subs from the Second World War, and the Germans only really had U-boats with different variations. Yes. Um, the British then have the T-Class, and please note, there you go, there's the streamlining. There's the, all the things the Royal Navy's putting in to try and get these ships to operate as well as they can. And I'm going to do HMS Frasher again because I was really annoyed to hear that that particular citation had been not re not listened properly, not declared properly. So that's going to get read up. And here's what I want you to think when you see HMS Frasher. Now, here's the thing. For the citation on the 16th of February, 1942, north of Crete, um, HMS Frasher sinks a, a, an enemy supply ship. Now, this is quite battle because it's yeah, quite important because, you know, Crete is a battle. And yes, it's lost, but this was going on at that time. The king has been graciously pleased to approve the, of the grant of the Victoria Cross for great valour while serving in HM submarine Frasher to Lieutenant Peter Scowen Watkinson Roberts, RN and Petty Officer Thomas William Gould. On February 16th, in daylight, HM submarine Frasher attacked and sank a heavily escorted supply ship. She was at once attacked by depth charges and was bombed by aircraft. The presence of two unexploded bombs in the gun casing uh, the presence of two gun casing was discovered after the dark uh, the, uh, after dark the submarine surfaced and began to roll. Lieutenant Roberts and Petty Officer Gould volunteered to remove the bombs, which are of a type unknown to them. The danger in dealing with the second bomb was very great. To reach it, they had to go through the casing, which was so low that they had to lie at full length to move in it. Through this narrow space, in complete darkness, they pushed and dragged the bomb for a distance of some 20 feet until it could be lowered onto over the side. Every time the bomb was moved, there was a loud twanging noise, as of a broken spring, which added nothing to their peace of mind. This deed was made more gallant, as HM Submarine Frasher's presence was known to the enemy. She was close to the enemy coast and in waters where his patrols were known to be active day and night. There was a very great chance, and they knew it, that the submarine might have to crash dive while they were under the casing. Had this happened, they must have drowned. And you can see the holes. That's something. <laughs> Think about that. In nighttime, 
you are crawling along, <coughs> bomb twanging every time he moves it, and you know any sign of aircraft. They can't wait to find out whether it's allied or enemy. They can't wait if they see a ship to see if it's allied or enemy. They will crash dive and you will drown. And they will have to pick your dead bodies out from inside the casing because it won't move. That is something fairly good, uh, fairly brave. King George V. It's a bit funny. Uh, uh, Seth Thompson, Dr. Clark, is the astute a modern T-class, or am I mistaken? Yeah. That, honestly, the I would say it's more an OPR. It's a long-range patrol submarine. That is what the modern nuclear SSN really is. It's a long-range patrol submarine, which is designed to ambush its enemies and destroy them. Um, but yeah, T-class, certainly. Jermak, RN, getting into the Black Sea would involve some serious cloak, dagger, and diplomacy operation on neutral Turkey. Why do you think Admiral Cunningham visited them in war spite, from memory, with several tribal class destroyers? There was a lot of diplomacy going on. Um, Shamak, guys, should we fire torpedoes at the enemy? No, let's keep advancing and then panic when people have to move to avoid ramming the enemy. Mm, yeah. Jamak. Or a real sub and ace navigating both straits and the Memora Sea all submerged. Probably. Jeffrey Wilson, there is a rather strong current through the Nile Niles. That was the problem for submarines going through the Black Sea, into the Black Sea in Model 1. It was still a problem for World War II. Jeffy, how are the deck guns used? I know of unbroken railway bomb moment. Um, pretty much if they found themselves facing off against, uh, and en smaller enemy, sh uh, smaller enemy ships, especially schooners and those sort of things, things that, uh, you know, they found a lot of the Italians kept using sailing boats to try and get past them. And they found that annoying because the sailing boats were not really worth a torpedo, but they're quite happy to take it out their three inch and four inch guns. And, um. Yeah, they had a lot of fun with that one. I was actually, were they really such different classes? OPNR seems more like incremental upgrades. Germans are the same. Uh, 7, 7A, 7C, 7C41, 7C42. Yeah. I would say the British are more likely to do, throw everything off to the wall and then build something new. Whereas the Germans are more inclined to do what are upgrades and what are transfers of technology. So I would argue that the British, especially once you look at the A-Class, which come out at the end of World War II. They're very cool boats. Jeff Beeler, KGV, there were at least four kinds of U-boats, U-boat Type 2 coastal training. Type 7 general purpose, Type 9 long range and supply boats. Hmm. Under undaunted FUD. I happen to come in on a moment of gallantry. Yeah, I have to say there is gallantry and there is crawling in a space where you cannot do anything but lie down with a bomb which is twinging, a twanging. Uh... Uh... Sam Thompson, Dr. Clark, what w would they have the mustard to undertake a bomb removal like uh, that, like on Thrasher again, or would they be there be procedure for de dealing with such a situation? The our whole idea is hopefully they're deep enough they wouldn't have to do it, and you don't really have that sort of um, how do I put it uh, outer hold thing. And actually, quite lucky they hit where they did. If the bombs had hit anywhere else on the ship, they might have penetrated one of the pressure hulls. Uh, and that would have been problematic, or at least the outer hull, which could have stopped them being able to take our emptied tanks and this sort of thing. Whereas hitting where they did, they stored in, and yes, it was a nightmare to get them out, but at least they had a chance. This, of course, is the beautiful U-Class. Um, I think they would do it if they had to, um, Stafford. They would. Donna Fritz, did Russian subs ever venture out to the Med or try and escape to Allied control ports in the early stages of war? No, they didn't. Jumak, you can use the deck gun when you can get away with it. Pretty much. 
there are a number of train drivers of this period in Italy who have memories of things bobbing up not far off the coast and going boom, boom, boom. Um, yeah, man, what were the Italian submarines getting up to during World War II? Pretty much trying the same, but mainly trying the same on the Allied forces. Go on, Eagle. Dr. Clark, why did the Americans use Hell's Cacks rather than naval navalizing the Mustang? Because navalizing the Mustang would be far more difficult. <sighs> this is a submarine one. Uh, but, you know, it wouldn't have been in that easy, and it was freaking difficult. The Mustang was... Mustang was a great land-based aircraft, but kind of like the Spitfire. Uh, the British navalized it into the Seafire because they didn't have anything else. Not because they were over-enamored with the idea of taking something with that spindly legs onto a ship. Drac reminded me today, during um, the podcast recording, of an old saying. In the Air Force, any landing you can walk away from is considered a good landing. In the fleet air arm... If you have a bad landing, you hope the pilot can swim. There's a difference in terms of the mechanics and what happens in terms of the aircraft landing that affects what navalization is about. Rashid, Dr. Club. What were the RN submarines' greatest effect on Model 2? <sighs> To an extent, it was the North Africa campaign. It was what they stopped getting supplied. Because if you think if all those supplies and the U-Class alone in the 10th flotilla account for 412,575 tons worth of supply of shipping, if that amount of supplies had reached North Africa, well, let's say, you know, when you consider that in cargo, that's probably about 200,000 tons worth of cargoes. That's a lot of supplies. That's a lot of material to keep the, uh, the force in North Africa going. Without that, that makes their job far, far more difficult. But I'd also say they had a big impact on keeping the Indian Ocean relatively clear of Japanese major surface units. And they had a big impact on the reconnaissance of German actions in the beginning of the war. So I'll try it like that. Italian subs were mainly in the Med, but also served the Atlantic and a few in the Indian Ocean. Yep, they did get around. Brock Payne. Uh, US Navy also strongly preferred radial engine fighters, and the Mustang is... Mm, yeah. Stafford Donson, uh, Dr. Clark, did the RN consider anything between the S and U classes for the Med? I know T is too big, uh, but that's uh, but that size I thought would help with dicing and making it through the Straits of Gibraltar. Um, not really. T class is used in the Mediterranean. Don't get me wrong; it is used. Uh, Royal Navy basically has a policy of it's a submarine and they're short, they're goes where whatever the type it is. But as Ian Carr writes. The U-Class are the only design used as intended, and um, they are used as they're intended to be, which is short is short is sort of sh shallow water submarines for the North Sea and for the Mediterranean. The S-Class are also used, especially it's supposed to be for the Mediterranean, but the S-Class was supposed to be Mediterranean Oceanic, so shallow to not so shallow seas. And really, the T-class, the O-class, the R-class, the P-class were all oceanic boats. Uh, 
Um, the T-Class, actually, it's going to sound strange, but if we consider it, the U-Class can do 120 nautical miles at two knots underwater. The T-Class can do 126 at 2.25 knots. So honestly, they ain't much better than the U's, despite their much bigger size, because they're different. They Their job is to carry their 17 torpedoes into combat. Yes, you heard me right. The T, the T class have 17 torpedoes. Especially the 1943 variant, which have three firing rearward, uh, aft, eight firing forward, and the three aftwards firing ones and the two forward are all um, K, uh, are all preloaded. They are they're attached on the outside of the casing, basically. Um, those those two tubes, so they are preloaded and ready to fire. They don't have people often go, "Why do you want a preloaded tube?" Well, there's two reasons. One, you don't need a dedicated firing position to fire it from. You can fire it from the control center. Two. And this is the probably the most important thing. It doesn't create any breaks in the pressure hull. Okay? It means that in the nicest way, you've got those torpedoes to fire. And you don't... Often they're in positions in the size of ships where you can, uh, don't really want a reloading room. You don't want to really have to reload something on top of the engine room or on top of your battery stack or on top of these things. So actually... Having it there, having torpedoes, it gives you aft-firing torpedoes or gives you extra forward-firing torpedoes when you need them. And remember what I said about ambush predators. The idea was that they would make, they would lie in wait. The enemy fleet would come up. They would make a snapshot. They would fire a full spread of torpedoes. Remember, you need two or three to hit that G-Sinker ship, especially a big ship. If we're going to say Eskimo loses her entire bow to a single torpedo, shrugs it off. But. They have to keep going. And to keep going, they need more. Uh, to, to, to score that hit, they need to help be able to launch a wider spread of torpedoes. So if you can launch eight torpedoes, if you can launch ten torpedoes, you're more likely to get those two or three hits on that ship because there's only so many they can maneuver. And if you have three or four of these things, you can achieve a mission kill on a force because, let's be honest, if you knock out a battleship and damage it, that's all you have to do. You don't have to sink it. If you manage to damage it by knocking out its rudders, knocking out its engine, its propellers, it will have to go home, and some of the force will have to go home looking after it to escort it home. You carry on. You do that twice. You've suddenly knocked out quite a major chunk of the force, probably had to go home. You might well have put the force at the point at which they all have to go home because they no longer have enough escorts to do the two jobs. Mm. Uh, Badham, did the RN use submarine tenders in the med, in the med, or were all operations done within the range of Malta? They were did use tenders within the med, but they some they used the tenders. Remember, the tenders would usually turn up in the ports and act as the base for it. So you might have a tender turn up in the med, or a tender turn up in Alexandria, especially as they moved along the coast and they started moving operations into new ports. The tenders would go along and they would allow the the submarines to keep up with the advancing forces. And the Freeman, the time on the batteries is really just for the time when hiding from aircraft during the daytime. So it doesn't need to be all that much longer, more or most of the time, um, to an extent. But it's also for hiding from enemy ships when you're making the attack. You want to lure them onto you so you have the perfect position. Remember, to get the perfect torpedo launching position, destroyers rely on speed and maneuverability. To put themselves in the way and then launch their spread torpedoes. Submarines rely on ambush. They rely on the ship coming to them. So they have to position themselves nicely, safely, and quietly. And then... So Thompson. Oh, wow. I thought they were their top submerged speed was 5 to 7 knots. Um, if they're doing the full 5 to 7 knots... 
then that's going to lose up their use up their juice very very quickly. They can do 120 nautical miles at two knots or 2.5 knots. It's a nice way of it does sort of that. So the faster you go, the in your sort of if you've got range along this axis versus speed, your speed is it, it, sort of does that. And at a certain point, when you're going full speed, your range is really cramped. Or, oh, mm, yeah, inverse, sort of, speed going from high to low. Uh, uh, speed going from high to low. And as your range, your range sort of does that. Mm -hmm. Thomas uh, Rotlight, Matrix Medway was sub tender based at Alexandria, it was sunk uh, thereabouts in June 1942, correct? Oh, well, I thought they top uh, that, that one. So, Thompson also thought the tea only had 12 fish in tubes with six backups ready. Um, what they had was they had six torpedoes, reloadable tubes, and then they had five more tubes. So they had 11 summary, uh, torpedoes and tubes, eight firing forward on the 43s, and three firing aft. On the pre-World War II ones, they had 10 firing forward and none firing aft. And if you don't do maintenance on the torpedoes outside the pressure hole, they're, in the pre they're mounted in, and they are hopefully good to go. That's the whole point of them. They are sort of maintained in terms of ways of they are taken out when you get back to port and checked. In car, through the worst days of Malta, they were resupplied by subs. What class were these? It was the R-class subs which were usually used. Awasaski, and what's the purpose of French specialty? Rotating tubes on decks? Polish people also said that we are standardizing on French designs. Uh, I can never really quite understand it. It's yeah. They have these ideas. They have ideas. Nicasia, and Dr. Hart, going back slightly, was anything useful learned from the work of the 3M class subs? Yes, there weren't much point in it. They would have been useful for multiple supply runs, but that would have been it in World War Two. Uh, you'd have taken the gun off and a whole load of stuff out and basically turned them into transport subs. William Cox, I've heard the Cagneys, Italian cruiser subs, were noisy. How noisy were Italian subs compared to, say, Japanese subs? Um, they were a little bit noisier, but not so much. Honestly, sometimes a lot of this stuff is made is basically accentuated because it sells books. Jeff Beeler, what was Henderson's involvement subs? Um, honestly, if you are looking at any subs which, uh, let's see, fight World War II, so you're talking U class, T class, S class, are all pretty much designed under Henderson's um, purview, which is always fun to know. Basically, uh, you know, they're, they're all to an extent designed or redesigned under Henderson's, uh, Henderson's purview. He rather sort of liked the idea of them being given more range, but there was only so much that could be put into certain size holes. Golden Eagle, Dr. Clark. Then why did US Air Force use the Mustang and not adopt the Hellcat? Seems a bit wasteful to produce two fire types. Uh, because it's the US Army Air, for, uh, Army Air Corps. And um, in the nicest way, it might be wasteful, but you've got a huge production lines of both, so it works out sense. It's it's only wasteful if you are seeking a perfect solution. And the nicest way, at the same time as they were producing Hellcats, they are also producing Wildcats, still were being built. And then there's Mustangs, and there's P-51 Lightning, and there's um, Lightnings, and... Uh, there's all sorts of fighters being produced at the same time. 
It's what you did. You had a lot of fighters being produced. You could afford to. Ian Carl. Would X1 summary scrapped in 95th useful in World War Two? I think I answered that. I said resupply of Malta. And if we kept it and retained it, Singapore. Sav Thompson. Thank you, Doctor. Ah, okay. The tube setup had my brain scrambled. Trying to remember as the chat goes. Once again, on my phone, so no checking, uh, no checking able. Ah. Mitchell Gates. Yes, you can lose over half the rated capacity of a lead-acid battery if you discharge rate is too high. Also, lead-acid batteries are bad, affected by temperature, lose capacity, cold. They lose capacity in all sorts of things. P47 Thunderbolts as well. I forgot that. Another fighter. Uh, there's so many land bait. There's so many fighters. I actually um, used to, there used to be a, a flight program called Microsoft Piloting or something. I, I forget. It was produced by Microsoft anyway. And um, I used to like flying the uh, Thunderbolt. That was a good aircraft to fly. Not my favorite. My favorite was a Wildcat, but that was because I could do naughty tricks in the Wildcat. All right. So this is the Mediterranean Theatre, and I'm going to give him a plug again. Map by Gordon Smith at www.navalhistorynet, and frankly, they're critical. So here is your point. You have Gibraltar at one end, then you have Malta in the middle, and then you have the Allied forces back in the eastern Mediterranean. That is where the submarines were operating from, as well as where the warships were operating from. And all our sort of... How do I put this? If you look in that middle, that sea of red bases from Italy down to North Africa, Malta stands out. It's kind of like Crete does as well, but, you know, in a good way, Malta stands well. In a bad way, Crete does. Carl Harman. Um, what major surface units were in the Med at the end of World War II? Pretty much nothing. It was all over in the... It was all over... Anything that could move out there was heading out to the Pacific. So anything which was in the Mediterranean at the end of World War II was pretty much in transit. Undaunted FUD. US and German torpedoes had issues in World War II, but did other major powers have issues? Were their R&D out to be effective or just not used in the same scale in hostilities? Um, they had them, but to an extent, the British were lucky in that they had been practicing with our torpedoes so often that whilst they had had issues, they had managed to fix most of those issues prior to World War II. And that is one advantage of having one of the largest navies in the world and also having operating around the world as much as the British do. You practice with these things a lot and you do a lot of live fire exercises and it helped, but they still had issues with the duplex. The duplex pistol was not always great. It worked first, it's not MS flights him? I think possibly it was, but I'm not sure. Um, Donna Fitz, how did the B-25 fit with 75mm fare in the Pacific, and was it used in the same way in the mid? Uh, to an extent. To an extent, it was... It's a fairly capable tool, but it's a very specific capable tool. So, you, you don't get have that many of them, that's the trouble. That's awesome, that's like... Bit off of an offshoot, if Rockefeller hadn't of killed the electric car back in the 1800s, how much better would sub-batteries have been? My understanding is that that was their flaw. Um, a, I take umbrage with the idea of him killing the electric car. I think he often takes credit for that, but I don't think he actually did. I think lots of things killed the electric car and back in the late 1800s in, ter in terms of its viability. But leaving that to one side, if they had been using electric drive for, you know, another 30, 40 years prior to then, 
that would have probably had an impact on sub development and have made batteries far more capable. Jeff Ela, how much do the RN operate in the Adriatic? Uh, well, some U-class vessels do get all the way up in the Adriatic just to have some fun. Donna Fr Daniel Freeman, Donna Fritz, you had the Mosquito with a six-pounder in the med. I think before the B-25's got the upgrade. Yes, you did, and it also had fun. Aaron, it sounds like a higher percentage of available merchant tonnage was sunk in the med than in the Atlantic. Is this correct? Pretty much, yes. Um... The med train was not a good place to be if you were a merchant vessel. It was really not fun. In fact, honestly, it was the, the Royal Navy did its level best to either capture you, sink you, or blow you to smithereens. Mitchell Oates. Um, P-51 and Hellcats were designed for different environments and different missions. Land-based versus carry-based, type of air missions. Ec it's quite difficult to take a land-based aircraft and turn it into an aircraft and to a sea-based aircraft, which is why... Whenever a nation does, you're basically looking at what is pretty much a brand new aircraft. Yeah, man, off topic, but would it have been possible for the Axis to move supplies from Sicily to Tunis by ship and then by rail to Libya? Um, I know they certainly would have liked to have tried that, but there weren't really the infrastructure in place to make it that viable. Um, but they certainly did try some things, and when they went into Tunisia later on in the war, um, it did become more viable. But while it was still technically French, and they were technically pretending to ref uh, to respect the French neutrality, it was kind of difficult. But there were some things sent that way. But also, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to arrive, and it makes it at mercy if they were sending it by rail, etc., and I don't think there was really a functioning railway at that time, um, that, you know, things like the long-range desert patrol would come and say hello. Um, hmm. Jemak, I mean, for, what do you, if for that you need railway, and there was only dirt roads and truck needed fuel themselves. Yes, uh, uh, that is the basic problem with Tun the idea of Tunisia to uh, Libya. Uh, if there had been a proper railway, or actually any railway, it would have been more viable. In car, large airborne cannon were quickly superseded by rockets. That is the full problem. They were, they were fun when they lasted, and they didn't make a big boom, boom, boom feeling, you know. It's kind of like when you're um, an A-10 pilot and you fire your gun. Michelle Oates, Stafford Thompson, a USN still used le uh, uses lead-acid batteries for emergency backup on nuclear subs. In advanced chemical batteries, uh, today have limited storage capacity. That uh, they do. Rock paint. The railways didn't run from Tunisia to Libya. The former was French. And yeah. And they had different rail systems, if I remember correctly. Sure chemical storage batteries don't have the energy density to make electric cars viable. You need a storage method with a couple orders of magnitude better performance. Hmm. Now, Gibraltar. It's always fun to say and it's fun to think about. It's mostly the um, area of the Ape submarine flotilla. For example, HMS Seraph here. And HMS Seraph is a jolly boat. Now, I put that uh, picture in there of the U-boats lost near Gibraltar. You've got 1941, 1942... 1943, 1944, and 1945. And really, in many ways, that shows you which were the big years where they were trying to put in. Uh, 1941, you can see the route they're trying to go, and it's not working out well. So 1942, they try a sort of wider approach. 
1943. Most of them seem to be sunk uh, on the eastern side of Gibraltar rather than the western side of Gibraltar. So perhaps when they're trying to get out. Um, again, in 1944, that's the same. And 1945, well, they're sunk not far from Gibraltar, but again, trying to get out, it would seem. Sean Mac, this is part of the reason I get so frustrated when people say Rommel didn't understand logistics. Yeah, decent grasp of the situation, but there wasn't anything he could do about it. Yeah. Uh, in card, does the map of U-boat losses of both Italian and German? Nope, just German. That's just German losses in the area around That is just the German losses. That is just the U-boats lost near Gibraltar. It's not pretty. Not fun if you're a, if you're a U-boat commander either. And that's the point. Gibraltar was a bottleneck on the Mediterranean, so. That's to an extent why the Mediterranean and the Battle Atlantic are so separate, because of Gibraltar. You pass through the Straits of Gibraltar, you pass into what is a very dangerous zone. And whilst you can, as Von Fritz says, um, uh, for that risk, then it seems massive for what reward. That is the point. You, it's theoretically a large reward because what the Germans knew and the Italians knew was if they get control of the Mediterranean, they can win North Africa. Is basically their idea because the logistics. You must remember, it's always a logistics is more always more a, a factor of geography and distance than it is a factor of anything else. So forcing the British to send logistics all the way around Africa to come into uh, come into Egypt from the back from the Indian Ocean side puts a tremendous strain on that logistics. The point is, though, by the Royal Navy, by control of Gibraltar, by control of Malta, managed to mean that any logistics trying to come across the Mediterranean was running a tremendous risk of getting killed. So the Germans, by their actions in the Mediterranean, were basically trying to knock the British out of North Africa, etc., by giving and putting them under the tyranny of logistics, and the British used uh, used Mediterranean to make that distance, that shorter distance, uh, far more dangerous. So the British had a longer distance track route, but it was safer to get the logistics. So, to an extent, once your convoys get past a certain point on the coast of Africa, it's very unlikely they're going to lose much. Yes, the Germans do move into the Indian Ocean, and this is the reason why, to stop off this logistics supply. But it ain't going to be that much. It just ain't. Because the British send full escorts. Those convoys do not go around Africa, etc., without protection. They have protection the whole way around. It is a full convoy escort. It gets there. It just takes time. In car, reward included Ark Royal and Barham. To be honest, I will concede Barham, but Ark Royal I won't, because Ark Royal was more lost through freaking terrible damage control. Terrible damage. Um, Martin Doherty, I, Dr. Clark, I read the Italians operated the um, chariots clandestinely uh, out of Spain. Is there any truth in it? There is. It's not so much that. There is a whole movie about it, and the odds are they did operate out of it to get to Gibraltar, but it seems to me more likely they operated it out of an Italian flag merchant vessel which had uh, decided to secure itself in a Spanish port for the um, war, that sort of scenario.
So that's awesome. That's just you, baby losses. A uh, question. Did any subs try to get to the Sears Canal through to the, through the desert? Mm. I don't think any did, but, you know, that would mean a fun story to try and do. Uh, silly Manicos. Uh, wasn't getting out of the hard and getting into the med due to different currents? Yes. You could, to an extent, float in with the current. On minimal power into the Mediterranean. But to go out of the Mediterranean, you have to be on full power against the current. And that just wasn't good. It wasn't good at all to try and do. And it made a lot of noise. And then there's the bioluminescence as well. Just to add more fun to you. Well, Johnson, that's a lot. When did streamlining of subs really start looking at the photos of subs? Uh, the noise they generated would have made them visible to Sonar. Um, basically, it starts to get going during World War II, but it's not really the last World War II that it, take, that it takes off. The Germans are trying it by the end of World War II. There are some, you know, bad new subs, etc. Type 21s, from memory, uh, etc. are really looking at it, and the British are looking at it. To an extent, throughout World War Two, but they're still building things like their gun casings, etc. And this is the mighty tenth, Malta, the U-boat war. How do the Italians use convoys completely, or just North Africa? They try to do it completely, but they're always short of convoy escorts. Uh, they don't have as much building as the, the British and the British and Americans and Canadians do. JMF, uh, Crowell's loss was also caused by questionable design. Uh, there is often that one is point up, but honestly, really, it's not. She designed in the best standards they can at the time, but there are some issues with her. Um, but honestly. It's more the damage control. The damage control really manages to muck it up. And that's because the damage control officers really didn't understand the difference of dealing on the particular ship. And they misunderstood some of the readings and some of the instructions from being guidelines to be making them rules. They, they forgot the operative word was to be careful. Um, I think I've been over that before in a video with um, Jamie. Of armored carriers. Mitchell's iron converted electric vehicle. 1,500 pounds of golf cart batteries. Useful air energy of one third of a gallon of petrol. That's the basic problem right there. That is a bit of a problem. William Cox, the Dutch had some streamlined designing on research speed. Yes, they did, but it wasn't really going much. And like it went that time. And Brock Point, the French had a lot of subs in the med as well. If they'd been able to stay in the war, how would the two navies have cooperated? Different operation areas, different operation areas, but also the Royal Navy sunk them as the war went on. <clears throat> that was it. The Royal Navy was sinking them. It, it, that sounds terrible to say, but they weren't sure who was in command of French boats as war went on, so they just um, sank them. So this is the t the list of kills during, covered by the period of this book of 10th Flotilla, a 10th Submarine Flotilla. Upholder. Two destroyers, three submarines, three transports, ten supply ships, two tankers, one trawler. That's 21 vessels and 128,353 tons. One submarine accounts for 128,353 tons of enemies sunk. Urge. Two cruisers, one destroyer, one transport, five supply ships, two tankers. That's 11 ships. For 74,669 tons. Utmost, one transport, six supply ships, that's seven, for 43,993 tons. Unbeaten, two submarines, two supply ships, one tanker, one collier, two schooners, that's eight, for 30,616 tons. Upright, one cruiser, one destroyer, four supply ships, seven, one floating dock. It weren't getting away. That's seven ships, for 23,408 tons. Unique, one armed merchant cruiser, one transport, two supply ships. Four ships for 20,382 tons. 
You and I, uh, Una, one supply ship, one tanker, one schooner. Three ships for 15,305 tons. Ursula, two supply ships, 14,640 tons. P-31, one cruiser, one supply ship. That's 12,100 tons. Sokol, one destroyer, two supply ships, one schooner, four ships for 7,642 tons. P-33, one supply ship for 6,600 tons. P-35, one supply ship, one salvage tug. That's two vessels for 4,471 tons. P-38, one supply ship, 4,170 tons. Union, one supply ship, 2,800 tons. And P-34, one submarine, 1,461 tons. Grand total, 390,660 tons. That's in the period covered by this book. They do well. Hi, Brock. Martin Dorothy, wasn't there a, what, an RN sub found a couple of years ago that in the med that have been missing since war? Yes, there have been lots of them found over the years. They, never, they weren't quite sure what happened to them. They were operating on the radio silence, so they often didn't radio positions. How, uh, Albert Susky, how did actually Italian subs get to operate on the Atlantic? They were sent there pre-war and then operated without return? No, some of them did manage to make it through the Mediterranean pre the... Uh, Italian declaration of war to the Atlantic. Some of the vessels which came back from Africa, uh, from African posts. So basically, the vessels which come back from Africa end up going to Mediterranean. You know, they get there. A couple of them get out there. So, Thompson, Dr. Scott, just seemed like a novel idea given how worried the military convoys were about torpedo boats, mines. Settle the bomb and pop off fish to fit the passing hulls. Hmm. Probably. Uh, Airman, thanks for answering my question about using railway to move uh, supplies to Libya. How capable are Italian shipyards at replacing merchant shipping losses? Not that capable at all. In fact, Honestly, they were doing worse than the British yards were doing, replacing losses, and the British then, of course, added on top of that the Canadians and the Americans to back them up, so that's why they ended up beating it. Um, hmm. Carl Harman, I trust Una it shares a name with my Icelandic friend. Is it an Icelandic name? I think it's Latin, so my, it's... it's num it does mean one in Latin, so it might give him the firstborn daughter, according to Daniel Freeman, and I think they're probably right. William Cotts, uh, Cryptic Icon, UB95, might have been found. Uh, cryptid Icon, uh, an odd resonance with a myth comes from the fact that a UB was found very close to an underwater cable. Maybe that was the sea servant of legend? <laughs> you never know. There's all sorts of things being found. Sometimes from Dr. Clark. The Union's, Holland, uh, the Union's Holland class was more fish-shaped than U-boats, T-class act. Why to step back in proper hull design for subs? Because honestly, they were it, in nicest way. It's streamlined when you're turn when you're thinking about operating. Uh, okay, so you're looking at the subs and you're thinking about them being streamlined for modern uh, for submarines like we have now, teardrops which operate underwater the whole time. These were submarines which were uh, vessels which would operate part of their time, or possibly the majority of the time, on the surface. That affects how things are organized. That affects how things are designed. And that's the point, really. They, you know, sort of their HMS Truant is a good example here of the submarine flotilla of Alexandra. She is designed with a bulbous bow, etc., to take more torpedo tubes. And she's got more torpedo tubes mounted back on the conning tower to fire forward and these sort of things. So she can fire her spread of 10 forward. She is designed to operate on the surface. She's, there's a reason she's given her operating range on the surface. That's where she recharges her batteries, but also where she does the most of her high, her high speed maneuvering. That's where she can get up to 10 knots or these sort of things. So 
there's a difference. It's going to be a difference in the design you're going to shape your submarine if it's going to spend a large amount of time on the surface versus if it's going to spend large, most of its time underwater. Um, Daniel Freeman has put the submarines per se, but submersible torpedo boats is a concept. I'd say that, that's pretty much. Daniel Freeman, in car. Doug Clark, does stay on a battleship that have floating dock collapse under it get the same prize? No. HMS Valiant does not get the same prize. So, Thompson, it's literally due to the limitations of the batteries and the power supply. They have to be on the surface because of their recharging the batteries, so you have to make them viable for being on the surface as well as being underwater. And that's the thing. These are the most of the things that you're looking at, which look bad for underwater operations, are there because they're good for uh, they're good for their surface operations. <laughs> Jeff Beeler, does it count mission kills like Bolzano, which was out of action for the rest of the war? No. The the Royal Navy submarine commanders didn't get them counted as kills, and this book doesn't. It counts them as um, basically as damaged. Hmm. Dr. Martin Doris, Wreck of Age Research, found late 2019. There was an article on the ancient BBC website. Oh, that's good. Well, Urge should have been found. That was deserved to be found. So I'm kind of, did the Italians use a snorkel device, or was this fort less useful than the med? Um, when they start to develop it, they are starting to look at it, and but it doesn't... By the time they have a working one, to an extent, or they're sort of looking at working point of it, it's past the point to which the Italians can get involved with it. Because the Italians, by that point, it's 1943, and there's all sorts of issues. Rage and Marina turn over to the Allies far quicker than anything. Now, Thompson, Dr. Clark, yes, the snorkel just adds to my confusion. They are developing the snorkel. And the snorkel isn't developed till uh, during the uh, during World War II. It's been tried at, it's been looked at, but it hasn't been actually made working. And in the med, again, it's not that useful, because if you're going to come up to snorkel depth, the snorkel, you're pretty much visible from the sur above the surface anyway, so, but you have no awareness, situational awareness, so you might as well be on the surface. Um, well, I'd say the Periscope Patrol by John Rain Turner is very good. I like the stuff by, uh, written in here by, um, a fleet Viscount Cunningham of Hindhope, a sailor's honesty. Uh, that's been used quite a lot, and if I now turn to page 400. June was another great month for our submarines. The small U-Class from Malta will continue to take a steady toll on enemy shipping on the Tripoli route, besides working off the coast of Sicily and Italy. The continued bombing of Malta, however, was giving them a little rest in the harbour, and to cheer them up, I, uh, up a little, I made them a signal. The strain of the continuous and arduous duties you are being asked to carry out is fully appreciated, but your fine actions clearly indicate that their necessity is very apparent to you, and I am certain that you will carry on with the same ready efficiency. The larger T-Class, working from Alexandria, were also having great success in the Aegean and off Derna and Benghazi. Apart from destroying two submarines, one Italian and one French, they had sunk eight supply ships or tankers and damaged two more. So great were the opportunities for submarines to inflict heavy losses on Axis shipping in the narrow waters and restricted routes in the eastern Mediterranean that I asked the Admiralty to send me all that they could be that could be spared. It's the naval equivalent of guerrilla warfare. Submarine time. 
I was asking, year 407 used to snorkel in Medtrain she was uh, spotted by ORP Garland and then sunk in combined attack with HMS Trowbridge and a bunch of other T-class destroyers. Um, yeah. T-class destroyers? Probably, yes. Town-class destroyers. Um. Hmm. Sunny Manakona, was it a snorkel that the Dutch were working on it at the same time as the Germans were working on it? Actually, one of the things I think find interesting think the snorkel was that the Dutch had a, a subsidiary of a German firm working on it. But they, it just, it's not, it's a sort of one of those things which comes around, everyone's sort of really looking at the same time. It's a logical progression, it's just, if World War II hadn't started till about 1944, you'd probably seen it on every sub in the world. But it wasn't, it didn't. Hmm. Stuff Thompson, thank you. I really need to look in more into subs. Don't know that much about them. Also, didn't uh, want to take over the chat by asking too many questions. Oh, you're more than welcome to ask questions. That's the point of having questions. And I've actually timed this so that these should, the slides finish. Uh, basically, the next slide is the last slide of the presentation. And then after that, they'll just keep going around until we finish tonight's Q&A. Which, judging by normal spanks, is usually about nine o'clock. So, um, yeah, there there should be plenty of time for questions. That's what I like to I like to answer questions. As Daniel Fruits put, ask questions. That is what this is all about. That is what these lives are for. The intro. It's always to remember that I treat the introductions as lectures, and the. Lives are seminars, so the lives are very much about answer, asking and answering questions. And that's the stat which really surprised me when I was looking at the same period, because, again... To emphasize this, between January 1941 and December 1942, 10th Flotilla alone. I'm just talking about the vessels which were operating under the command of 10th Flotilla from Malta. So purely those vessels. It peaks at 12, but it's usually it's operating around about 8 or 9 available, uh, actually operating and within the Flotilla at any one time, of which usually only about 6 are probably at sea uh, at any one time. Sank. 412,575 tons of Axis shipping. Okay. You have le uh, roughly 21, uh, less than 21 times that amount is sunk by the Axis submarines, the entire Axis force in the Battle Atlantic at the same time. It is. And they outnumber them by a lot more than 21 to 1. It's just it's mind-boggling. It is. It's mind-boggling. Because if you think about it, if you're talking about the number of submarines the Germans are prepared to chucking at it and have got operating out over there, it is... And yet, when you talk about... It, I'm not going to do a sort of hands-up because this group listening is pretty much is fairly switched on, but I actually will do I'll say, how many of you honestly had heard of Tent Flotilla in the Mediterranean and the U-class submarines and what they got up to in the Mediterranean before these talks. I'm sure there must have been a couple of you have, but, you know, even before when I was doing the research, I'd sort of had it in the back of my head that 10th Flotilla and Malta had done well, but when I looked at the stats, I was going, what the frick? They did really, really well. And no one talks about them. We all talk about, oh, we've got to learn. The, if we're going to be good submarine captains, we need to learn the lessons of the German aces. Well, HMS Upholder is far, far more of an ace than, frankly, some of these German captains. She gets 21 kills in the Mediterranean. Yes, she gets sunk, but, you know, she's good. Hopefully the mic isn't clipping too much. Uh, I, if I get loud, it does sometimes go clipping, but I have, I said, it only needs to be turned a little bit. If the gain is turned just a tad, it starts clipping. If it isn't, 
it's fine. Hmm. Ian Carr, wiki page suggests that there is still some doubt on the subwreck discovered. Maybe HMS Pandora. That is quite possible. Until you go and do a full investigation, you won't know what they are. William Bolton, weren't the Brits looking at snorkel type device in order one? Yes, but again, the technology wasn't available to make it really work. To make a snorkel work, it needs to be viable to work. It's going to sound strange, not just uh, as the snorkel, but when it's down and under water at deep pressure, it needs to not suddenly break. So you need to be sure it's going to work. Garrison, to what extent were British subs designed to take on other subs? Um, let's put it this way. The British hadn't not considered it, and they had a function into their designs, but it never been done prior to World War II. Um, there is a German claim, but in World War II, there is only one sub-on-sub -sub underwater kill. All the rest, they're on the surface, and so they're basically like another surface ship, just a small, more manoeuvrable one, or sometimes less manoeuvrable one. Mm-hmm. Block Prane. I think several people worked on a snorkel at the same time, but the Dutch had the best overall design. Um, they had a flapper valve which could prevent the snorkel from being flooded in certain sea conditions. Alaski, Wikipedia refers to an S and T class of two flotillas. If the class is named otherwise, I'd gladly be correct. Uh, I'd gladly be corrected. Um, there's the S class, and then there's the T class. There are two classes of submarines. I'm not sure uh, if you're if you're talking about the the Royal Navy submarines. The S class and the T class are different classes of submarines, and they're both about forty odd of them built or more. Um. It's fun times. So, Tom, you class, yes. Templo to learn, no. Hadn't come across before. Ah. Well, that's useful. Uh, well, I've heard bits and bobs about all this, but this is why I proposed the topic to start with. I know. Anna, I was not aware of how much they did and thought it was mostly air powered that period, with subs doing special ops in Italy at Adriatic later in the war. They were doing a lot of stuff. It's, it's again, it's. It's the silent part of the silent service. In car, 10th flotilla, four, plus force K, plus aircraft, were all operating from Malta. What turned to tonnage lost? Well, I gave a figure of about 2 million tons of Mediterranean, of Italian ships and uh, of merchant shipping was sunk, uh, of shipping was sunk in the Battle of Mediterranean, as it's called, of Ac belonging to Axis forces. Pardon me, Axis forces. Um, 400,000 tons belonged to the 10th flotilla alone. In two years. Once you go for it. Honestly. I would say the forces of Malta. Probably account for about. A uh, half. If you're being generous to the rest. Possibly as much. Uh, I sort of a million tons. Um, 50 percent. If you're being less generous. About. 1.2 to 3 million tons. So you could be talking as high as 65%. So it's between 50 and 65% of that sink, that stuff sunk comes down to the forces deployed in Malta, in my opinion. I was asking, I've heard a lot about the terrible twins, uh, ORP, Sokol, and Dizik, but that's my little Polish Navy deviation. That's good. Only three for three. I knew some British uh, made Dutch submarines were present in the med, but um, mainly because one of them was able to sink a German U boat on the surface. Mm. Danny Freeman, Arvid Sasky, the Poles in World War II were many things. Deviant is not what that springs to mind, though. Gurkha, travel destroyer levels are scary, is what that springs to mind. <laughs> yeah. Macros, only reason I knew about the subs in the med is that I came across it by accident. Um, 
had heard of Upholder, but had no idea before research about how successful she was. She really, you know, it's one of the interesting things when you look at the Upholder. And also, let's just get this to the idea. The thing that really amazed me when you get through it, and I was, I, to an extent, I knew about this, but I wasn't surprised by it still. Okay, upright. Commanded by Lieutenant E.D. Norman and then Lieutenant J.S. Wraith. Utmost. Lieutenant Commander R.D. Cayley. Unique. Lieutenant Commander, uh, Lieutenant A.C.F. Collett. Upholder. Lieutenant Commander M.D. Wanklin. Victoria Cross and DSO, two bars on both posthumously. Usk, Lieutenant PR Ward, then Lieutenant GP Darling. Ursula, Lieutenant AJ McKenzie, then Lieutenant AR Heslet. Undaunted, Lieutenant JL Livesey. Unbeaten, Lieutenant EA Woodward. Union, Lieutenant RF Galloway. Urge, Lieutenant Commander EB Tompkinson. P33, Lieutenant RD Whiteway Wilkinson. P-32, Lieutenant D.A.B. Abdi. Sokol, Commander Kenicky. P-3, uh, 4, uh, Lieutenant R.P.R.H. Harrison. P-31, Lieutenant J.D. Deby Kershaw. Una, Lieutenant D.S.R. Martin, then Lieutenant C.P. Martin Auburn. P-38, Lieutenant R.J. Hemingway. P-35, Lieutenant S.L.C. Maiden. P-36, Lieutenant H.N. Edmonds. P-39, Lieutenant N. Marriott. Spare Commanding Officer, Lieutenant J.D. Martin. They're all lieutenants. They're all the youngest level of officer that can be put in charge of these boats, and that's, in char uh, that's who's running this. Think about that. These are men in their... The vast majority, when they're looking up their ages were in their early to mid-twenties being put in charge. We talk about the age of German U-boat commanders and how young they were. These were just as young. And that was that way from the beginning of the war. So, the vessel found in 2019 of uh, Malta has been confirmed by the Royal Navy to be a resurge. That's good. Sam Thompson, Captain Clark, would this catch Henderson up? Um, what would you prefer? Budget is being cut. You can have cruisers or subs. What's your pick? Uh, if if I was Henderson and I had to pick between cruisers or subs for the Royal Navy, it's a difficult one because most of the time I need cruisers, but if when I really, really need the subs, the subs are all what they will do. Um, in that simple way, I wouldn't want to pick. I'd probably have to go cruisers because of the scenario I'm facing in the Royal Navy, but I wouldn't want to pick. I want subs as well. Uh, Bajan, uh, what can small nations today with diesel submarines to learn from other two operations, particularly in enclosed waters of the Med or perhaps the Baltic and the Barents? Uh, if you're going to be operating, uh, have a good first salvo because the odds are you won't get a second salvo. And that's what's really important. Make sure you get hit with the first hit. Martin Dorothy, Dr. Force, Force K, uh, Force H, Med Fleet. Heard about tent flotilla mainly unbroken and having to dive at their moorings due to bombing, but mainly surface and air fleet and aircraft. Hmm. Right, heard passing mention of RH subs in the Mediterranean are in subs of the Mediterranean over the years, but no idea they were this successful. Jeff Hiller, you mentioned that two million tons were sunk. What percentage of the Italian merchant fleet were this? Uh, it was the overwhelmingly percentage of the Italian merchant fleet. It was the vast majority of the Italian merchant fleet. Actually, when I wrote. Uh, one of the reasons when I did research on this, I didn't. When I looked into that, look, looked into it, and went. One of the reasons they don't do an evacuation attempt evacuation of North Africa is they don't have the ships left to do the evacuation of North Africa. Uh, the Royal Navy has been very, very effective. There are ships left, but you know, they, they've lost a lot, a lot of ships. They lost a lot of ships before war even began. You have to remember, the Italian fleet lost a lot of ships out around the world, which the Royal Navy quickly gathered up. Or which had to hide in neutral ports. The same with the Germans. And then you have this going on.
Turning free for free, ambition. Go train at the Dutch submarine force. They do the perishes and very much consider them their, their, their turf. Probably do. I think the only rivals to the Polish Navy are uh, are only matched by the Polish fighter pilots who served in the RAF. Um, I'm fairly sure also the Polish parachute brigade are blooming lethal. I used to uh, a couple of their former members used to live up my road. Great guys, massive dogs. They bought houses next door to each other. Um, Mark Dorothy, meant to hold a rub and broken. Jamie, most of my knowledge of our holder's record is based on being led to it by reference to Lieutenant Commander Wanklin and his personal record. Hmm. 23 for free. In the 70s, 80s, they did a lot of intelligence gathering in the Med on the Soviet fleet units. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if that was what the Dutch were up to there. Oh, Pike. Were the submarines from Malta based in Valletta? Did they need reinforcement pens to sink uh, akin to the ones the Germans built? Uh, they would have loved those pens, but no. They were based in... I'm going to have to look it up again to pronounce it, because it's... La, 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 la. It's Lazaretto buildings on... Um, Near Salema Harbour. And they are part of the old quarantine station built by Knights Hospitalers. So, um, there I tried to look, see if there's a map in this particular. There is some pictures, I think. Yeah, that's Lazaretto Creek. And that's where the submarines are sort of. That's the sort of submarines. This is the U class. This book is lovely, by the way. I'm not sure how much Periscope Patrol is currently on Amazon. I myself bought this book only recently. It's part of being part of the revelations of this, and it's been a really, really good book to have. It's been really interesting reading about the U class, especially when it's going to sound strange. Once I started looking for the things, they were very relatively easy to verify as being true. But the trouble is, it's finding all the stuff. It's all spread around in little bits, so you don't really notice it. And that's about the only book I've found which has brought it all together. Brock Payne, regarding the percentage of the Italian Merchant Marine, one of my figures says in the late 30s they had 786 of um, 500 tons plus four, roughly 3.3 million tons. That Probably wouldn't. That probably sounds about right. Ian Carr. So, Mac, you class have some excellent names. Ian Carr. Apollo was on her last mission prior to her in the UK for, uh, when lost. Yep. Tim Coleman. Uh, British R class submarines in 1917 18, submerged speed 14 knots, uh, specifically designed to hunt and kill German U boats. Apparently, one did an attack and hit a U boat, but top did not explode. Yeah. The British kept the idea on, but you know. Joe, Ola Pike, even if they needed them, Britain wouldn't be able to build them. Imagine the amount of cement needed to be, to be transported. Uh, that was have been a thing at Malta. It would have been interesting. Um, you could probably have built it, but it's, it's a fairly large amount of supplies of thing of materials in Malta. But actually, getting the stuff out there would have been interesting. Danny Freeman, Dr. Clark, Reagent Submarine Commander's World 2. A game for young men, and I'm not, and I know I'm now more thoughtful in my late thirties than my mid twenties. Probably, there are a few left-hand commanders though in it. Uh, but, uh, the point about the tonnage is it doesn't represent those achievements correctly. Subs often caught a, a 130 ton schooner, fired from ship's gun, boarded, crew found maps or mi of minefields, then boom. Yep. Oh, that was definitely part of the advantages. And that's again the reasons why the Royal Navy emphasized cruisers for economic warfare around the world, because cruisers could stop merchant ships and board them far easier than submarines could. To be honest, a submarine could do it to a schooner, but. If it's a larger merchant ship and it gets off a radio signal, then you'll sub on the surface, and that's just not fun.
Ian Carr, what is the origin and the use of Jolly Roger on the Royal Roads? Well, it, I think it dates back to World War One. Basically, when they've made a successful kill, they fl- or a successful mission, they fly the Jolly Roger when they return. I think it was um, for it was the Harwich Force submarines which started it first. Those under Tritt's command, and Tritt was the type of person who would definitely encourage that sort of thing. It would create camaraderie and force and force uh, joy. But um, in terms of the Royal Navy, they have that, and they also have a broom. If they all their war shops they fire hit work, they can mount a broom as well as the Jolly Roger. Clean sweep. Uh, Ian Shumak, and imagine the Iron Service were part of the reason the Italians didn't have enough oil to send or Rommel more oil. Yep. Because you can't very easily get the oil, move the oil around Italy. You know, it, that's the thing. You don't have the logistics available once you start losing these ships. Um, Brock Payne, regarding the percentage of Italian merchant marine, I've already read that up. In, Dan Freeman, in car, I believe it was a reference to summaries being only fit for pirates by an admiral in World War I or just before World War I. Uh, yeah, pretty much. There was an admiral who said that, apparently one of the crustier British admirals, and Twitt responded by allowing his guys to fly a Jolly Roger. It's kind of an interesting thing in that... Okay, there's a cynical part of me that says that prior to World War I, the Royal Navy was worried about its submarine arm in that they didn't think they had a unifying culture. They felt that they were too new and there was a war coming up and they needed to start building a culture themselves before World began. Otherwise, they could get a culture which would be problematic for them longer term. And then up and come this curmudgeon old admiral suddenly says this in public, writes a a letter in the press... And what do you know? The Admiral in charge of submarines suddenly produces a whole load of Jolly Roger flags that he can give to his commanders. And then they hoist them when they come back from successful missions because they're pirates, you know. I'm sure it's completely... uh, I am absolutely positive it's completely spontaneous and it's just... Twit managing to be very quick at reaction, but it just is so quick, it makes me a little suspicious. But that might be because I live in a more cynical time politically, and that could be what I'm thinking. I could be judging past people's actions by today's standards. Sam Thompson, Dogs Clark, glad I could shrimp you, sh- you shortly. What was the preeminent iron sub World War II? Was it T class or another? I'd say the T class is probably the highest and the most kills. But um, especially when you consider how they operate around the world. But the S class do fairly well, so they won't be far off. And I, frankly, I think the U class pound for pound are probably the best performers. Um, what about the Regia Marina? Italian subs, how effective were they? My understanding is that they had the largest sub force at the beginning of the war. They certainly had the largest sub force amongst the Axis powers at the beginning of the war. Well, out of Germany and Italy. Japan and Japanese was larger. Japan was larger, I mean, and the Brits definitely was also larger. Um... Definitely they had the largest sub force in the Mediterranean. And they did quite well, but they had problems. In that... Their problems largely begin and start with the fact that they're in the sort of scenario where whilst there's lots of merchant shipping going across for British submarines to attack in the Mediterranean, most of their targets in the Mediterranean aren't merchant ships, they're warships. And warships maneuver a lot faster and tend to fire back more. So that kind of changes your stats a bit. 
And if you look at the Battle Atlantic, the big number of kills, those are mostly merchant ships as well. Um, Thomas Breyer. I found a couple of passages of the Fighting Tenth by John Wingate. This is one of the reasons I managed to verify some of the stuff in that book I've been showing you, but I couldn't get a copy of it either. So, again, I have no real idea how good it is, but the passages I read were quite good. I mean, could the RN have been more aggressive in dealing with the Royal Navy? Uh, perhaps bringing the Mediterranean fleet to battle to try and secure their supply lines in North Africa? That would have been the only option. But they don't wanted to bring them to battle in ter on terms that they would win, and that was always the problem. You know, getting the force together so that they could outmatch the Royal Navy. They came close in some of the battles of Cert, but, you know, not as close as they wanted. Hey, man, and how was the inter-service cooperation between the RM and the Italian Air Force? Um, how do I put this politely? The Rager Marina and the Italian Air Force, the Rager Aeronautica, um, I wouldn't say they're quite the Imperial Japanese Navy versus the Imperial Japanese Army, but I would certainly say that there is not much love lost between the two institutions. They are closer to the IGA and the IJN than the RAF and the RN. And I wouldn't say the RAF and the RN are not without their friction on a fairly regular basis. But it's never really wholeheartedly trying to um, get the other ones to fail their missions. Paul Johnson. Real well, Amazon shows a used paperback for six hundred sixty-five pounds forty-eight. Enjoy. Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, that one hundred sixty-five pounds forty-eight. That sounds a bit much for a used paperback. Daniel Freeman, real oil field supplies in North Africa. Uh, it feels like uh, there is considerable iron news, large oil reserves now find Libya. What would Rommel have given to know about that? He knew about the fuel. They all knew about the oil. Why do you think Libya was wanted? It was one of the reasons it was such a precious resource to the, uh, to the Italians. The trouble is it's not just oil you want. You need to refine it to get make it useful. And where are the refineries to look after the oil coming out of Italian North Africa? Carl Gasman, one of the RN surface fleet admirals, said something offensive about submarines being pirates. So in RN tradition, they adopted the Skull and Bones ASAP and immediately got a link to the history of privateering and the pirates in... British maritime history, a rich cultural vein they could draw from and find their culture and inspire them to forward onto greatness. Yes, it's amazing how these things work. Danny Prim, Dr. Lyle. Join Re Jolly Roger and Submarines. Don't forget sailors are often good at sewing, so they may have knocked them out themselves. Potentially. But, um, no, some actually very good quality flags appear very quickly. Um, very good quality ones. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, so maybe. The sailors are good at sewing. But, again, the materials for it, for them to sew, appeared rather quickly. Yes, captains might have individually gone out and got them themselves. But, you know, it seems rather too quick and well-organized a response. Um, 
there is the argument between the S class, the T class, and the U class over which was the best of World War um, Two. As I said, the T class I think wins it just about on tonnage, but the S class will be very close in a tonnage sunk. And frankly, pound for pound, my bunt money is on the U class. But if I wanted to do what I needed the T class for, I wouldn't want a U class. The U class get the pound for pound victories because the waters they're operating in are where there are going to be a target rich environment for them to take out. That's the Mediterranean and North Sea. That's where they come across the German coastal convoys that are going up and down to Norway. They go and operate into the Barents Sea. They do all sorts of things. Um, you know, that is their advantage. They're operating those environments. The T class and the S class have the advantage are operating also in the Mediterranean, also in these areas, but they're also off, 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 um, often operating on long range cruise missions. Night name production. Wait, I thought Max Horton had started the Jolly Roger tradition. Also, hello, Dr. Clark. No, it was started long before Max Horton got to a senior position. Although I'm sure he'd claim it, but that's mainly because he's, to an extent, as an r and admiral, he's, I have been very nice about him, but I would say on the self-promotion front, he is kind of like the MacArthur of the Royal Navy, in that although he actually does, unlike MacArthur, have a lot of substance to back up his claims, he does kind of jump on stuff. It's kind of like, um, I have a book around here, which I was talking about on the weekend, which is the one about um, Fraser of North Cape, where he was director of naval ordnance. So suddenly he was in charge, according to Lewin, asked World War II, of building the battleships. No, he wasn't. He looked after the guns. And even then he had to answer the director of naval construction was sort of going, you quite sure 14 inches enough? Yes, the Lord, first sea lord has told me so. Are you quite sure? Yes, the first sea lord has told me. You bloody idiot. Should have said a 15 inch. <laughs> yeah, Henderson was not always that enamored with him. And he caused him problems by delaying the 4.5 inch. <laughs> that wouldn't that was not particularly not appreciated. Particularly not. Um, Angus Osana, is the Jolly Roger part of official flag signaling? Not officially, and unofficially they aren't supposed to be carrying them anymore, I think, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if you still find one somewhere. Uh, in car collection, Jolly Rogers at Portsmouth Dockyard Museum suggests they were very much handmade. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. So, Thompson, thank you, Doctor. I think you're pretty close to the mark in regards to Roger. I know Twit is wrong. I tear it. Come on, camera out of focus. That's the trouble. If I move into here, it sort of goes, hello. But if I move to here, it's back in focus a bit. Or it should be. It should be. It's a bit of also focus system. Um, Martin Doherty. Uh, it shows you how good iron subs were when the Italians would run two cruisers loaded with fuel, uh, fuel drums across the med by only to be intercepted by HMSC and go... Yep. Um, you know, they had fun. That was the Battle of Cape Bon, and that was the the, the Royal Navy go uh, the Royal Navy tribals going, hello, bye-bye. And the U uh, the you know. What's fun is cruisers like that were what several animals had campaigned for the Royal Navy to build rather than tribal class destroyers. And they got sunk by tribal class destroyers in a rather emphatic point of we're better at this than they are. Calm Gasman, how often were airstrikes called on by uh, submarines uh, uh, noticing ships they cannot nail? Very, very rarely, because in fact, I don't think ever. Because if they radio, they, uh, they activate their radio to call an airstrike, they reveal their position to the local to the enemy. Um, if they got back intelligence and then there was a photo fly overflight and that spot is still there, then they'd go and attack them. But you know, not radio call. Hey man, why couldn't the Italians replace their merchant shipping? Lack of materials, fuel, shipyards, act all free, all of the above. 
and plus you're having to maintain the Ranger Marina and do all their construction work. They're not even really keeping up with that. And any supplies you have going to that are not supplies going into tanks and other things which are needed for the war effort. Um, Calvin Gasman, on ships, especially warships, there are amazing workshops for every day immunities, even on subs. Besides, you have black fabric and access to acid batteries. White patterns are rather easy to make. Yeah, yeah. We'll go for them being handmade. I'm just jolly suspicious at how rapidly, pretty much every submarine in the fleet rapidly uh, suddenly how responds with the same thing, with rather similar looking designs in many, many regards. Yes, there is some variation, but they're rather similar. Yeah. And there are certainly ones which appear which are far more... Um, Hmm. Hmm. Let's put as high quality. I was asking, I've also heard the max. Yeah. He's a very good admiral, uh, admiral and very good commander. He certainly does raise it when he comes back after some missions. But I don't think he's a the first... He might be the first to actually raise it when he comes back, but he isn't the first to have it to go to sea with. Ian Carr, appreciate River Class Large Subs. Uh, they are for the Pacific, and they'll be very, very good in a Pacific War. That's pretty much what they're designed for. Hard, uh, ambush predators in the Pacific. Silly Manakotas. Uh, oil fields discovered in the post war. Allied and Axis apparently accused each other of poisoning wells by pouring petrol into them when it was actually leached and naturally. Ah. I thought there was some oil discovered in there pre war and it was going back to, Amer uh, to uh, Italy for refining, but maybe I'm wrong. As I said, maybe I'm wrong. But I did think there was actually. A oil field working you know, in the, uh, in Libya, and the oil was being transported back. Maintain production in our all in our all two favorite scenario, where Battle of Norway is won by the Allies in the long run, and by the midpoint of the war, is they entirely in the Allied hands? Would you be able to deploy subs to the Baltic? Yes, you would. I think the RN got some subs into the Baltic anyway. And I think it was been the U I think it was the U class or the P class which was sent. Um, Airman, did the friction between the RM and RA affect their ability to combat the Royal Navy submarine threat? Yeah. German yeah, Nuclear Production. If this would happen, I would compare this U boats crossing Gibraltar and where to base them inside Leningrad. That's where they think they were based from. Richard Hughes, I want to see killer giraffe. To see the killer gira giraffe. Ah. There you go. There's smoothie. <laughs> Let's see. I have literally walked around London with him peering out of a pocket. You know. Um, Rock, uh, Rock Payne, US subs aren't supposed to carry Jolly Roger either. But apparently the Special Forces Seawolf came back to port a year or two ago. Flying one. Says the Navy. Oops, my bad. Yep. It's always better to ask forgiveness than permission. If you ask permission, you get told no, and you then do it anyway. You get into trouble. Well, uh, the HMS Gara found a Jolly Roger for Air Belgrano. A particularly interesting flag design. Yep. Not how much German. Oh, Night Heron Production is having trouble spelling. Don't worry, we all do. Hmm. 
Nick Waters. Sand equipment might not officially include a Jolly Roger and a broom, but you know, they had them. Mm. The broom is slightly more difficult to find. Uh, oh, apologies, uh, I, but I see the Iranians are planning to blow up their fake aircraft carrier again. Did any navies make fake warships in World War II? I found British fake battleships in World War I. The British made had several fake battleships and things wandering around the world in World War II. Someone were the sort of warship, battleships which were technically left over from World War I as training assets, but they were <clears throat> made to look like battleships again and went out with convoys to try and deter surface raiders. Vision. I read that it was political media controversy when Atreus Conqueror flew the Jolly Roger when returning from Falklands. There was, but frankly the Royal Navy wasn't bothered about it, and neither was Margaret Thatcher. In fact, Margaret Thatcher probably would have wrapped herself in the Jolly Roger if she thought she could get away with it. Um, No, no, nice one. It's a ping uh, it is a penguin. There is a penguin called Admiral. Uh, there is uh, the killer giraffe called Smoothie. There is the poodle, technically called. Well, it's something beginning with G, but I call her Blackie because we used to have a black poodle called Mozart. Gigi, as I said, I call her Blackie. And Wooly the sheep with the hat, a funny hat next to her. Uh, Mozella, the cow from Cheddar Gorge, the Cheddar Gorge, can you tell me? And Nuts, the squirrel. It's a good collection. They're a good, they're a useful gang for when I need to uh, need to discuss stuff. And I've also got several seals and blue whales and dolphins up there for when I need to do some navels things now and demonstrations. They do come out occasionally, as you know, and if you watch the videos. Thomas Froyer also British essentially invented fake military stuff to confuse reconnaissance. Danny Freeman. Yes, they did. Uh, we loved fake stuff. We had entire fake divisions, uh, blow up fields and fields of blow up tanks, which we carefully camouflaged. You blow it up, you stick branches over it, they presume any things they notice which are wrong are down to the camouflage and their branch coverings. And you have an entire division sitting somewhere. Because, of course, most of the division is going to be camouflaged, so it only requires a dozen or so tanks to be divisible, and a few piles of twigs and branches in there, and suddenly they've spotted an entire division hiding in plain hiding somewhere. It's brilliant. The Royal Navy didn't try any blow-up destroyers but that would have been quite fun. I, I, I wish the Royal Navy had tried some blow-up destroyers. Um, if they'd managed to make them sectionally blown up so that they were sort of tied together, but in individual sections, so that when some bombs hit, bits, only bits and deflated and the rest held up. I mean, very, very cool. Turning 3434, uh, did the Royal Navy submarine force exercise with other navies prior to World War II, or not so much due to expected neutralities? Uh, not really. Submarines doing joint exercises together, if, if difficult enough to make exercise with submarines in your own navy. Um, 
Ben Laura, when did the RN phase out its World War II subs and how you sort of post for? Most of them served into the 1950s. They were very useful as the Royal Navy worked out what the next generation of subs were going to be. They were building the A-Class, but they're slowly building them. Uh, Carl Gusman, uh, Penguin named Admiral. Skipper had a promotion? Yes. It was well-deserved. Skipper needed a promotion. Stephen Wilson, I know that we did fake port. Oh, yeah, that was fun. Shemak, or the German spying that British uh, Britain is completely controlled because counterintelligence was a joke. Um, I, I, not I, actually, not just completely controlled, but actually made up. The spying was actually two people. I, I think one man and his secretary, who came up with a very complicated folder and thread of stuff, and were basically just sending it and getting record, or getting awards and. The some of the spies were getting awards and all this sort of thing. It was just, it, it was amazing. It was a beautiful play. Um, Jerison, the Germans had a similar reuse and had a fake vehicles act. The Royal Air Force let them know it wasn't real. Uh, no, it wasn't real by dro <laughs> by dropping a rubber thousand pound bomb. Hmm. William Bond, oil was suspected a little bit. Exploration stopped with the war. One of the big what ifs could have been have eased Axis fuel concerns and made Italy a bigger player. No, it would have certainly done. Daniel Freeman, sure, Mike. Do you mean double cross or XX system? It was literally every German spy. Yeah, as I said, it was. There wasn't every German spy in Britain. It was basically one pair of people who were pretending to be a lot of other people. Who didn't exist. And every time they tried to land someone, they got captured. Stephen Wilson, it's amazing what you can do if you light some fires to confuse bombers into dropping their bombs on countryside rather than actual clients. Cities. Yep. Uh, Stephen Thompson, the, uh, Dr. Clark, the current RCN destroyers might as well be blow up as now. Sorry for not being as activist uh, as I'm tearing a foundation. Oh, good lord. Well, enjoy the foundation and yeah. Sherishan Shomak, the best one I heard of is the top agent landed in Britain with a German accent, walked into a pub at breakfast time and ordered a pint, then asked uh, what way to his objective. Um... Yep. Luckily, day drinking wasn't as much of a problem then, but it was kind of obvious. Uh, in car, Atrus Iron Duke was very much a battleship in 1939. Three remaining from five uh, times 13 half inch turrets, one times 5.25 pro type fire, film on YouTube, damaged by bombing and beached in Scarba Flow. Hmm. <laughs> Daniel Freeman, the section was done by magicians and theatre chair and cinema types. It was all about hinting and being aware of how something will be seen. Yes, it was giving them enough information that it looked like you'd been giving them warning, but not enough information you actually could do anything with it. Ben, all right, I do not think it entirely uh, or within the remits of possibility that Admiral Canarnas was a British agent. No, he was just standing out. Nick Waters, they would nudge the V1 and V2 aim away from the cities by having the pet spies report that they were falling long, short, or whatever. Yes, and also occasionally there would be some fighters go up and go, Boop. just for the hell of it. Thomas Rotten, Agent Sorotorian had an eventual, eventful war. She sailed to Gibraltar, one of her engines failed, Cape Town, where she collided with a troop carrier, then escorted a troop convoy to Malta, hit by a bomb act. Hmm, fun times. Nick Waters, my aunt told me a story that when she was little, the odd man who lived upstairs was one day led out by police, the spy. Hmm. Paul Johnson, the last person executed at Terralon was Joseph Jacobs, a German spy. Yeah. They did have fun, and it's... <sighs> Let's be honest, the submarine war was the crit was part of the critical war in the Mediterranean, but it was also part of the, the counterintelligence war. Because if you manage to stop the Germans being able to freely move around, you stop them being able to gather information so they become more dependent on what they're being told. Brock Payne, was the Aegean a common area for the 10th Flotilla to hunt, or did other sub tend to work the Aegean? The 10th did go up into the Aegean, but also the 1st from Alexandria would go into the Aegean as well, because they had longer range, bigger boats as well.
So the Aegean gets covered by both. Mainly because it's a nice, rich hunting ground. And because you can have a lot of fun winding up the gems in the Aegean. Jerison, you caught up. It happens occasionally. Ian Carr, HMS Centurion was later a block ship as part of Mulberry Harbour Breakwater. I'm not sure if she's still there. No, I think she was towed off to be scrapped. Ben Arnott, not Navy, but I loved the fake water pipe that was supposedly dug in a lead up to El Amin to the fool the Germans that the attack would be in the south, each night digging up what was laid. Well, it works, and then you lay it back, you know, further stretch. Keeps it going. Mandarji. Dust Clark. Mark Clark was landed in French North Africa before Torch by RSM. I can't remember its name. Oh, I think it was one of the T class boats, wasn't it? Not sure, though. Pat W. Did RSM uh, transport spies or special forces during the war? Yes, they did. Very, very much. They had a lot of fun doing that. I don't think it was Upholder. Um, Upholder. Uh, it would have been. One of the Gibraltar flotilla boats, if it was going to be anything, but not one of the Malta. So it'd be an eight flotilla. So it's either going to be an S or a T. And I, I'm feeling it was a T for some reason, not one of the S boats. But I could be wrong. Honestly, uh, to be honest, I am. Um, uh, the submarines are fun, are, are, are fun, but it's sort of it's sometimes you find records which point to one, and then it was another one because that one wasn't available because got held up on its missions or it's found its batteries badly. They have more issues than destroy than even destroyers do and they're being heavy worked. It's one of the S class, Serif, I think. Ah, Gordon Collins, that would make sense. Although as I said, my suspicion was one of the T class, but it is Gibraltar's area, which is the eight flotilla, so that would be an S class. And that would be the presumable area where they put it get on a submarine rather than trying to do a submarine across the Atlantic to get there. Benoit, regarding Canaris, uh, I just find incredibly that someone so key could be so net. And so no surprise if a double agent. No, he, he just was in it. Look, to get to the top of a naval organization, you need to be good at politics and you need to be able to connect to the right people. Um, if you're good at command, that's even better. Because theoretically, you don't get through a certain level unless you're good at command. The joy of the Italian Navy suddenly expanding and uh, with First World War and Second World War, it managed to bump up quite a lot of people who might have otherwise never got to senior positions. So Canaris gets bumped up at just the right time, has just the right connections, and so manages to coast through most of the rest of Canaria to get up there. Inertia was just as um, interesting. In fact, honestly, I'm going through the list, mental list of Italian admirals and I'm, I'm not that sort of impressed mentally by any of them. They do have some good moments, but they do make some big whoppers as well. Jay Richardson. I don't think he was as inept as he did really good work in Norway, Poland, and Denmark. Canaris? Um... Mm. Similar, I thought uh, licensing laws restricted times pubs could uh, serve alcohol. So asking for a pipe before noon was like announcing you are from another planet. Ah, uh, yep. That is part of the fun. <laughs> Jerusalem, I. Uh, Martin Arty, according to Wiki, it was ser uh, Seraph, though that is not 100%. Yep, Seraph it is. Um, basically. There are very, very easy ways for you to get caught out if you're not well prepared as a spy. And the Germans had a habit of falling for all of them in Britain and in America, it seems. They also had fun there. So they tried to land some people in America and they got lost and captured, I think, remember?
Now, it could be I'm confusing admirals. Let me just see if I am confusing admirals. I, uh, no. I think I am. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, I think I'm getting, uh, I think I'm getting Canaris mixed up with, um, Casadi. Let me just remember. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting... Uh, because we've been talking about the Mediterranean, I was getting Canaris mixed up with Casadi. I do apologize for that. That's who I was thinking of. <laughs> Sorry, Belenora. It happens. <clears throat> now, okay, so Canaris did okay as Intel Chief in, uh, uh, as Intel Officer on Dresden in World War One, but in World War Two, he also left... Evidence against him in his office safe. So, very mixed at best. Yeah, I'm not sure Canaris are that great either, but uh, I was getting him mixed up with an Italian animal. Go on, Collins. It was Seraph. She was also, he also has a USN captain at one point and drop off the man who never was <coughs> near Spain. Hmm. She has a fun war. Nick Waters, ISTR, they also had to transport a French general to get a deal with Vichy and pretend it was a US sub because he ha he hated the British? Um, probably. Uh, Greg Stelzi, Ben Canaris was a net. He was uninterested in helping the Nazis. He deliberately sabotaged a lot of operations outside Germany. Gave Jews credentials from agents to get them broad out. Hmm, interesting. True. Um... Uh, Ben Laura, sorry if Dopey, I've been up since 0500 AM so since now, so I'm since I'm now back at work. Ouch. And in production, there was that sub that dropped that poor dead fellow of Spain with false papers. I think that was Seraph as well. Um Operation Mincemeat. Come guys, we rejoin it. Consider Scorsese's ruse in the Battle of the Bulge. I'm a we just do not know their uh, just do not know their successes. They do have some successes. The Germans aren't completely and utterly inept. But you know. They just don't have as much successes to talk about. It's one of the interesting things, you know. Greg Sassy. I think a lot more will come out about Canaris as British files get released. There are rumors of him meeting British agents. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> we're fairly good at keeping stuff secret, and we tend to burn it. Uh, in the nicest way, the National Archives does not have a complete record of everything at, at all. Um, 
there are all sorts of files which disappear. There are files which aren't even secret, which get burnt and never get stored in National Archives, let alone, you know, d d don't get me wrong, I love the National Archives, I use the records, I really enjoy them, I really like using them, but um, I am highly suspicious of that, them ever providing the complete record of everything, of anything. Stafford Thompson, Dr. Clark, don't forget the German weather station is set up in Newfoundland during the war. It wasn't found until late 50s, early 60s. No, it wasn't found. William Bolton, UK society is a patchwork of groups with many obscure shillefs. The Germans didn't stand a chance. Yeah, that is quite true. <laughs> uh, Daniel Freeman, under the Nazis, the modus operandi of leadership was to create competition and infighting among departments and ministries. Ex so canaris just need to be better at that. Eh, yeah, probably. Uh, Daniel Freeman, which would you rather be in? A national disaster? A med? In the med, a disaster class or an M class? A disaster class or an M class? Um, do I have to? Can't I? I don't know. Go have a cruise ship, <laughs> town class cruiser, <laughs> driver class destroyer, <laughs> anything. <laughs> I'll take a U-class submarine. <laughs> Why do I have to pick between a disaster and an M? M probably slightly more survivable, but why? <laughs> uh, okay. Um... I think they said that the um, landings would be on the foot, straight to the foot of Italy, that they were going to bypass Sicily and go straight to the toe of Italy, and actually they didn't, because anyone with half a brain would see they weren't going to do it, because they were going to use it as a dry run for what they were planning to do in Normandy, which is use land-based aircraft as part of the covering. Well, it well, was the hope. It didn't actually work out like that, and they ended up being dependent on the carrier aircraft, but we'll leave that to one side. That was a plan. That was an idea. God damn it. It would have worked. It would have all worked perfectly if we just had the logistics and the planes and the everything to do it, but we didn't. So, yeah. Thank goodness for escort carriers. Just mm, terrible, terrible reality getting in the way of perfect plans. It's just uh, 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 terrible. It's also been a long day for me. I have had five, no, four seminars today. Plus two and a half hours of recording of podcasts. Plus the videos which then didn't work. And now this. So I am going a bit strange. Just just tell me and I'll you know, sidle off somewhere. And on the Todd. Well, I, hell, I tried to buy you an iron brew, but I'm in Poland for work right now and YouTube is not going. Night, night. Take care and all the Todd. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I'm saying to do it. Uh, thank you for free. So, battle class being equipped with wave motion gun confirmed. The amount of nervous to the south. It would have been an interesting scenario <laughs> if he had. Um, Ben of Room, am I the only one that thinks that a shiblef is more like something from uh, Cthulhu uh, than an old social thing? Mm. Something else, a shiblef is from the Bible. If you pronounced the word wrong, you were of the, one of them and promptly executed. Mm. Ian Carr, was the subterfuge landing not on Sardinia? Um, I I think it was no, I don't think it was mentioning Sardinia. Would you say Sardinia and Greece were the targets, but Mincemeat presented and implied that Sicily would be a decoy? Yeah, I thought it was the tour of Italy, that's why they moved. 
they moved a whole load of ships of, of, of landing of torpedo boats, etc., out of Sicily to Italy to protect Italy. So that's why I always thought it was Italy, but you know. Vision, you make the National Archives sound like they're on by Sir Humphrey Appleby. If they don't want you to find something, they will happily direct you all around it. No, it's actually it's worse than that. You see, you, you must remember the National Archives don't automatically get all the materials. The Ministry of Defense and all these things pass their records to them once they're finished with them. And um, trouble is, some of those records just get destroyed. Life happens. This, uh, All sorts of things happen. All sorts of records, you know, just don't get put in. Uh, they just don't. And then there's the stuff which, of course, just never gets revealed to the public. Um, my girlfriend is currently having a mild, mild uh, war with the National Archives because something has just been added another 50 years to its hold up. And frankly, um, that's basically it, you know. They're having fun. They're having, you know, a lot of critique going on. And they managed to get through the stuff, though. They managed to get the stuff put in there. But it, it's whether or not it's going to actually get ever released, even some of the stuff which is in there. Just keeps adding on. The Falklands War has gone from 50 years to another 50 years have been added on. Or I think it's 49 years this time. It's been added on. At the 49-year mark, which will take it to 98 and then at the 98 year mark, they probably add another 48 years, which will take it to 146 years. And then, then they'll add on, I don't know, another 47 or so years. And it'll just carry on that way. Cthulhu. All right then. Steph Thompson, Dr. Clark, sounds like you need to take Heide for walkies. That would certainly make my day a lot better, taking Heide for, Heide for walkies. She deserves it. Night Heron Productions, it's kind of a topic, but any thoughts on the Explorer class subs, or the Explorer class if you prefer? Uh, they're actually fairly decent submarines. Um, I, I quite like them for the Italian Navy. They do quite well for them. But the thing is... They give some to Spain, etc., and you know they lose them after the Spanish Civil War, and that's really not not that much uh, that much um, help, really. Danny Freeman, Major, my best friend works at the National Archives. They do not sound though, as though they are as efficient as Sir Henry Humphrey would want. To be fair, they uh, the, the National Archives, the archivists themselves, try really hard to get things and sort it all out for you. Um, it's just the stuff which comes to them. Especially, it depends on the departments. Some departments are even weirder than others. You know, if you want a really fun time, try working through the Treasury Department documents. They make the Ministry of Defence look I'm a, a transparent. Vision, don't remember. So, I remember Sir Humphrey's efficiency was in Stolon, a stonewalling his minister. Dr. Clark is right. They are the middlemen in the, getting government records from other departments. Yeah. Then, if you uh, Dr. Clark, there it suggests that something in his records would be rather embarrassing to international relations, uh, even today. Perhaps a national hero, actually a traitor? No, uh, it's. Um, particularly, it is a, um, a memo written in prior to World War I which states that under international law at the time, the Argentines might have a claim, might have a claim on the the Falklands, is what it sort of says. I don't think it actually says they do have a legitimate claim, but it says they might actually have some claim in law. And uh, therefore it's disappeared and never appears. But... <sighs> To be honest, it's been as passed as international law has changed since 1910. 
and you now have the right to self-determination. And that's the Trump factor of everything. Uh, pun and uber pun in both intended on that one. And the right to self-determination, if you consider they had a vote a few years ago, a nice land grand plebiscite, and overwhelmingly decided they want to stay as a British overseas territory. So that's what they get to stay, they stay as. It's the, it's the, the joys of the modern international law. International law is very rarely codified. When it is codified, it causes even more trouble because it sets even new precedents. Nine hour production. Fun. A little tad bit. I just found out the Explorer class, HMS Scalabas Prayer Group, is now at Gold Course. Here is the caption on the wiki picture below. Periscope of the golf course used to see over an adjacent sand dune and tell if the first green is clear. Cool. Then from ambition, they get given the records to store by the departments who are, I think, keen to stop having to pay for their storage. More than likely. Um, can you go with us? A case full of yes minister vids would get you a long way bartering in Eastern European 80s. They loved it. I'm not surprised. I was referring to the post war to HTP subs, exploring a cover. Hmm. I thought you were referring to the Italian subs. Um, they were pretty cool, uh, pretty capable. But the trouble is, it's one of those things. Once you start developing nuclear power, is that is that going to work as well in the short to medium term? Long term, we might actually return to HTP as an idea for submarine development. But now, I'm currently we've got nuclear subs. In ambition, in America, we have Freedom of Information Act to help get government records, but the legal process can drag on for years and years. We have the same here, but uh, they can always go national security. Bing! Janeworth, are you sure they won't just stamp the documents in infinity? Not allowed to in law. They can just keep them for practically infinity. Ben, I actually I have to say, Nick Waters, that is quite cool, even for a non-golfer. As another non-golfer, I might actually have to go play around round of golf just to use that periscope. Ben, Laura, I know there is a periscope in use at Ellie Golf Club on, in Fife. Ooh. Gone Eagle, Dr. Slot. Do Falklands have MPs in Westminster? No, they don't. They're a British overseas territory. They don't have MPs in Westminster. They have their own Falkland Islands Council, and they have a governor who is basically a foreign office ambassador usually from that sort of level, to go out and act as sort of British head of state. And they do very well. They sort of, it's basically a British overseas territory. They look after all the diplomatic stuff, all the foreign stuff, foreign, foreign policy stuff is the purview of the British government. So, you know, it works okay for them. Um, At the moment, as Daniel Freeman says, no too tiny population. But honestly, if the world changes at all, they expect to see Gibraltar and Falkland Islands potentially get MPs. They might not want them at the moment, but depending on how the cookie crumbles, it might be a necessary thing to start started off with. Dr. Thompson, Dr. Clark, golf course can also be road rally track if you get a quick card. Woohoo! As we all know, as a Subaru driver, I, of course, obey all speed limits, Mr. Policeman. I am very well behaved. And I never, ever drive on dirt roads and just see how fast my foot can go, uh, how fast my car can go. I would never do that, Mr. Policeman. I'm a very, very good driver. I have to say, I am actually sort of quite, uh, especially when I have my little cousins get in the car, I am very, very careful when I'm carrying other people. Because in the nicest way, that's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> oh. 
So after Thompson does look like, would the crown take uh, current Canada back? Our current PM is so inept. Um, to be honest, I don't think there's any Western government which is really doing that great at the moment. <sighs> Dr. Clark, Tony Freeman, you're in the wrong job. I have a friend who's a Hems doctor and gets to drive very, very fast around Lincolnshire with blue lights flashing quite a bit. Um, in one of my other careers, occasionally I get to drive very, very fast, but illegally. But um, that's not one I discuss ever discuss online. Uh, Bijan, in America, Freedom of Information Act is often used for mundane documents and meeting minutes. We even had people sue to see public planning documents for highway and railroad projects. Hmm. Paul uh, which class of sub was used for mine laying, or was it all? Pretty much all of them. Uh, theor uh, theoretically, uh, the bigger votes of the the P, the O's, the P's, and the R's were going to be used for mine laying, but in the end, they all get used to it to an extent. <laughs> Nick Waters, buddy of mine, kept a lovely blue and gold Scooby for years. Finally made it big and got the Ferrari. When she crashed within days, that doesn't surprise me. Ferrari has nowhere near the turning circle and performance, and the uh, maneuverability of a of a Subaru. It, I, I I love Ferraris, and um, I have to say I do love the idea of a track day when uh, you get to drive Aston Martins, Ferraris, and Ford Mu and um, Ford Mustangs and these sort of things. Mm, not Ford Mustang. It's not a Mustang, is it? Is it no. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, but um, it is a Mustang, but in the nicest way. Yeah, the Subaru is good for turning circles. It's good for maneuverability. Wilson, the Spanish government has dropped its cl old claims on Gibraltar amount, I think, uh, as part of the negotiations. They've had to put them to one side. Uh, they haven't dropped the claims, they've just dropped them as part of the, uh, the EU negotiations because they were basically told by everyone they were s causing too much trouble. It's part of the process where everyone drops the things which are causing issues and inconveniences which don't really um, pertain to the important business at hand, which is probably going to be some form of free trade agreement, which will have some give and take in it. It's life. It's how it works out. They start off screaming and shouting from opposite sides so that they provide themselves lots of cover about saying, oh, we won't give in, we won't give in to this, and then they meet in the middle. And... Where exactly they meet in the middle and how it sort of things is usually sort of rather than being like that or like that is usually sort of more like that. I some one side wins on one thing, but might concede ground on another, and that's how it works. Paul Johnson, how are mines deployed from subs? Um, sometimes out the torpedo tubes, sometimes they were just on the casing outside and were just let go. They had various versions of mine rack systems to carry them and deploy them, which could be fitted. Um... William Cross, Biscay Cross was a good, good idea. Uh, our, RWR are important items of equipment today. Uh, radar warning uh, yeah, receivers are important, but did we get a radar warning receiver in the USN or URN subs? Yes, they got them. Especially by the end of World War II. It took a while to get them. I think they had some of them at the beginning. Brock Payne, the only Mustangs worth driving are the old ones. My dad has a 66, so what if that doesn't zoom around like a new car? And yes, the Subaru is good. Yeah, I'm glad. Um, how are the torpedoes fired? What mechanisms are used? Well, they would have various types of fuel in them. Depends on the type of torpedo. Um, and pretty much you have an ignition pistol almost. It's, it's, you open the doors, start the engines, and it goes off. And it has some inertial guidance to try and keep it in a broadly straight line on its axis of bearing. 
Later on, you have homing torpedoes, etc. develop that actually will steer themselves. But in the beginning, it's basically a straight shot weapon. And so once you've started them, they're, they're often shot out with... How do I put this? Something broadly like an air cannon, it's air pressure. Boom. To burst them out of the time, uh, to burst them out a bit of the tube, but you know it—it's a fun scenario. <laughs> Albertowski mines were deployed not only from tubes. Germans had horizontal shafts, French and Polish five mine launchers fed by conveyors. Yeah, there were lots of systems tried to develop, but uh, you know. Some of them were more successful than others, and some of them were downright risky. Um, Stephanie, I think if that you've said good tactics of Spanish, they play innocent, hope it all goes from the Brits making Sp Spanish nationality more attractive to Gibraltars. A, they are not doing it. Um, they're not. <laughs> it's. It, sounds like smart tactics, but they're basically being forced to do it with their hands behind their back, and publicly it's, it's acknowledged that this is the case, and they don't want to do it, and B... Mm, uh, Gibraltar is a British overseas territory, and they have enough freedom of manoeuvre themselves that they can have a lot of um, success being a British overseas territory versus being part of Spain. Uh, there is a difference when you're a British overseas territory than when you're part of Britain. Uh, and or when you're part of Spain, Spain would not make Gibraltar a British, an overseas territory. Spain would make Gibraltar a part of Spain, and that would again be a different scenario. So, actually, for some places around the world, being an overseas territory is quite a financial advantage and incentive because you set your own domestic policy whilst not having to pay towards much of the foreign policy. Okay, so um, I, I, I know there are many, many. Ideas which go round the round about what will happen post any sort of scenario in, in international relations, but I, I I do not have the feeling that the Spanish will get the Gibraltars flocking back to them. They haven't been part of Spain for a long time, and they really don't like it. Um, especially not with what Spain keeps playing around with the games they keep doing. Carl von Gasper, did World War Civs lay seabed magnetic mines? Um, I think some did. I wouldn't like to say 100%, but I think some did. So, Thompson, Dustfuck, are the motors really as small over there as I've heard? My first car had a 5.8 litre. My current track is 4.7. But most in town are 2.5s or 5.3s. Um, well, my car's a 2 litre. It's fine. Um, it, it's going to sound strange, but it, if you're looking at a mostly urban driving environment, you don't need that much power. And then when you're talking about the countryside, well, again, my two litre does fine with its four wheel drive. But if I was living deep in the country, I'd probably have a Land Rover Defender or something similar with a little bit more literage, and you know, my mom's car is about three liters, so you know. Um, Brock Payne, two of the big US mine layers had 40 torpedo tubes uh, for mine laying, the mines were sto shoved out the back. Mm, yep, 40 inch torpedo tubes. Yeah, I think there were some British mine layers fitted like that as well. Generation of subtitles. Yes, most cars like 1.6 or on average. I have a 5 litre Rover V8 in one of my defenders, though. Wife's AM GT12 has a 6 litre VL12. Ooh. Come on, Gasman. And there were torpedoes which were set to run a given distance straight and then in circles. Fun time in a convoy. Yeah, those were especially fun. Vision. I read that the SSN USN Jimmy Carter has an extra 100 foot section for Mission Bay. Command Center, Moon Pole for UAVs, and berthing for 50 Special Forces troops. Could our new search ship sub? Um, we have our own deployment stuff which we fit on any of the astutes, and that makes more sense for us. Having a single use sub for the USN makes sense for the Jimmy Carter because that is there for the bigger missions, and they have other sort of small missions for Britain. 
uh, we just have the smallest things because again having the specialist sub would be an extra sub which we could far easier prefer to have an extra astute we have um a chamber which we attack which we can attack on attach onto the back of pretty much any of the astute class and it attaches bolts into the a part of the um sail and it bolts into there and it connects on and allows for divers and a dive vehicle to get out So Hamilton, I don't thought the Spanish would be successful, just hopeful. Um yeah, I I yeah. Possibly hopeful, but I'm not sure about successful. Uh Gonio, there seems to be quite a lot of parallel between Hong Kong and Gibraltar. Yeah, apart from in the nicest way there's no treaty governing Gibraltar governing Gibraltar. Um so that's firmly safe. It might have been it, it gonna sound strange. If Hong Kong had worked better as a sort of two two nation uh, two systems one uh, nation system profile, perhaps there would be more success going around for those sort of things. Uh, no difference is that China had a treaty, not uh, not they're more powerful than Spain. Um, within NATO and Europe, Britain couldn't have used the might is right approach. We'd have had to go by the treaty if there was existed a treaty, but they didn't. Meg Waters, I remember reading a book uh, by a U-boat captain saying those torpedoes were in very short supply, e.g. just uh, one homing and four or five of the looping ones, which seemed like a great idea attacking convoys. That, they do seem fun. Sure, Mac, it's complicated, but it will end with the people want and the people don't want Spain. That's usually what happens in life. Um, basically, the USS Jimmy Carter to understand what Bishop was saying, is a specialist built for when those missions are really big and able to be planned in advance around the sub's availability. So it's for the really big, not the reaction ones, the long-term planned ones. Derrickson, Wood Defender, don't expect it to go fast unless you want to live with double maintenance of a Rover V8 or shell out for the... Oof, yeah, there's lots of things to make a maintenance. Uh, the, the Defender go fast. Go on, Eagle. I answered that, I think, a bit back how torps are launched underwater, but basically it's um, high-pressure air engine starts. Boom. Make sure your doors are open. Don't be the submarine that tries to fire a torpedo with its doors closed. That doesn't cause fun. If we're going to build an extra general, it's going to be built as an SSGN. And honestly, I think we should build an extra general. As I put in my um, video, I would like an extra dreadnought in terms of have inserts and have two of them rolled as SSGNs and two three rolled as SSBNs. And if one nothing happens to any of the SSBNs while they're in a fix and maintenance, one of the SSGNs can have its stuff, to, the slots taken out and be turned back into an SSBN. Um. Daniel Phillips, did anyone consider torpedoes bigger than 24 inch for their subs? Not really, because you have to maneuver them around inside the sub. And as Drac was making the point about sort of gun sizes in terms of uh, uh, in terms of guns, if you've got a two people to lift it, that's your six inch gun. When you've got the weight of a 24 inch torpedo, you've already got to have all the mechanization, all the stuff to move it and to get it move around. And that's a lot of weight moving around in a contained environment, which is not really that great. So, Thompson, I can understand that. My mum's Fiat is a 1.4. My brother's 93 Toyota has a 2.2 learning leaning tower of power. Max it at 250 kilometers per hour. <whistles> Would love a 2.8 TDI for my Dakota. Hmm. Then, Freeman. 
Bertrand, the long lead for our single play, uh, single place that makes SSNs, SBNs means that even if you wanted one, it'd be the 2040s, 2050s before it came into us. That is the other one. Yeah, we do have a single production now for nuclear submarines. It's one reason why I would like some diesel subs. Anyway, take KJ Richardson, and I'm hearing noises from down below, so I might do the same in a bit. There are swim out launch types of those and which shoot out torps and there are swim out types and those which shoots out sorts of compressed air. The former are the stealthy silent hunters. Yep. But it's still an issue. The um, compressed air ones have a higher initial speed. Hmm, my actual notes. Came across a USNI book on my last boat. 1994. Covered the history and development of USN's World War II fleet of submarines. No idea if it is still available. Well, that'd be interesting to find. Second lesson. I must admit that I'm surprised the Chinese were not more patient. If they had been, they might have stood a chance to lure Taiwan. Again, a thin chance, but not the open hostility they have now. Yeah. we That's getting well into build pumps area, so I'm not going to jump too much on that, but yeah. Patience would have been a virtue there. <laughs> Calm Gasman, one can still... No. No, you don't. You do not. Do not. Never. SSGNs, not with nuclear weapons. Do not. Because here's the problem. Okay? You keep your SSBNs for nuclear weapons and your SSGNs for conventional. You do not put nukes in your SSGNs because the moment you have nukes in your SSGNs, you will have a mixture of conventional and nuclear missiles. And at some point, someone will accidentally launch a nuclear missile. And before anyone says accidents don't happen, nuclear bombers have fallen out the sky. The wrong bombs have been loaded into aircraft by mistake. This has all happened in the Cold War. You do not want to do it in a scenario where you've got two systems which look exactly the same, having different warheads. So if you've got an SSGN and you want to use it as an SSGN, have it as your conventional boat. Do not ha then have nuclear tips or nuclear warheads, because what do you do if you launch one by mistake? Are you sure you launched the nuclear one? Will the people in the submarine know they launched the nuclear one rather than regular one? Probably not. Will you, once it gets online and it's up in the air, will it tell you it's a nuclear warhead or does it report as a normal warhead because that's what it's been programmed as on its launch? There are so many options. No, no, no. Keep SSGNs, SSBNs. SSBNs carry nukes, SSGNs carry the conventional. That is what it should be. Nice and safe. Nice and separate. <laughs> And as Nick Water says, it is possible to knock down a Tomahawk. Not so much with a Trident. <laughs> Paul Johnson, what's the range of the average torpedo? That's a closely guarded secret. The modern ones especially. Ah, <laughs> oh, Golden Eagle, we all wish our leaders knew what they're doing, but uh, you said Chinese leaders know what they're doing. I'm not sure any leader in the world knows what they're doing. I think they're all making the best guesses on the best estimates they can with the information they have available and in the cultural context of their upbringing and their thought process. And that doesn't necessarily mean they know what they're doing. That means they know what they think they're doing. Or rather, they think they know what they're doing, but do they actually know what they're doing because they know how the other people are going to react? It's, it's it's a constant game of 3D chess, which everyone is making the best cho choices they can and hoping that's right at the moment. Been, uh, Jeff Beeler, been away. How effective were British torpedoes? Quite effective, and they were improved during the war. Go 
Calm gas, but deterrent. Honestly, on a deterrent mission must be exclusive loaded cruise missiles. Agreed. New cruisers. I, yeah, but the trouble is if you have one on the deterrent and one on non-deterrent, what happens if the wrong missile gets loaded into the wrong sub? Before you say that's not going to happen, if both the sets of the missiles are the same as they will be, because it will save money, that will eventually happen, because you're talking about 144 missiles being loaded on each submarine eventually one two three four five patrols in it'll happen and the wrong uh, wrong missile will end up in the wrong set and maybe you'll notice it maybe you won't and yeah i, I just know have ssbns ssgns keep it separate safer uh jeff Beeler, what lessons did the british learn from their summer campaign um that if in doubt fire a lot of fire first fire fast and far hard that submarines are best used as ambush predators and they did work that well that out but also make sure your first shots count because you won't get a second one Modern top range, uh, as those tend to be variable set of speed settings, so range is fluid. Yep. Bar paint, a constant game of 3D chess. A quarter of the players are cheating, a quarter don't know the rules, a quarter are trying to rewrite the rules, and the final quarter think the rules don't apply. Yeah, that sounds about right. Right then. As we are now well and truly onto the topic of the, um, what do you call it, COVID in the um, current chat, I think I'm going to call it in the evening and go walk the currently very much quietly complaining, but still complaining, fluffy research assistant. So I'm going to answer the last questions, and then I'm going to call it night about quarter past. So thank you very much. Thank you to all the Super Chats. Thank you to everyone who is a patron. Thank you to everyone who is on Discord. Thank you to everyone who's put up with the very noisy for, uh, videos which are aired up. I will fix them. Well, I'll re-record them, and hopefully get the sound settings will be better. It's just it annoys me. It's one little nodge, and it makes it go terrible. And um, I'll see you on Thursday for the pre-tribal destroyers. So let's see. Any questions? Um, Jack uh, Hunter, it's not really Mediterranean, but do you know any interesting sources detailing the S-Class submarine HMS Salmon? Um, there is actually a book on the S-Class, but I cannot remember its name. But there is a good book on the S-Class, which came out in about 20... in the 2000s sometime. And it would be about the S-Class. Also, look up um, 8th um, Flotilla at Gibraltar. They were all S-Class, and I think Age of Salmon did some time with them. And U-Class are just there. Very cool ones. Calm guys, one. Nuke deterrent desigen. Ah, I forgot. Use that as long as your boomer is out of those. Rather than exchanging different VLS tubes. Not on a pressure hull. Well, you don't need to exchange, the diff uh, exchange different VLS tubes. Um, there's actually a system which was designed by BAE about 10 years ago, which fits into the standard Trident tube and just slots in with the cruise missiles. And it's the cruise missile launcher slot inside the space, which is normally taken by the ballistic missile. And it can oh, pop it up launch and then close and sort of sort itself out so it's actually quite a clever system it hasn't ever been deployed but it's my basis of saying right then britain should build five rather than four and then we'd have two ships which we could use conventionally for the initial day of you know the carrier of the strikes take care king george v thank you william bolden thank you jack ray albert 
Richard, um, William, Vision, Stephanie, Carl, Alex Jacobs. Concerning Mr. Nixon, Murphy was an optimist. Yeah, definitely. Danny Freeman, thank you. Take care. Richard Hughes, thank you. Uh, Angus, thank you. Deep uh, Brock, thank you. Take care. Derp Squad, take care. Thank you. Paul Johnson, thank you. Jack Ray, sorry I joined late. I'm glad you would get here. Take care, Vision, Bill and Laura. Right. Take care, Eric. Take care, Golden Eagle. Turning 3434. Three, Good. Take care. And take care, Nick Taser. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Take care, Martin. Take care, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Take care.